Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. I hope you guys had a great evening last night. It was a beautiful day. Got to get out and enjoy the sun. Um, something that's kind of rare here in Juneau, in the Southeast. But we'll go ahead and get started. Um, to, we had President Peterson on yesterday to do a welcome. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to join us, but today he is. I'm honored and glad to have President Richard Peterson of the Central Council click in and hi to do our welcome this morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody. Good to see you, President Jackson. Uh, my name is Shahya Ish. Uh, grew up in the village of Kisan, and I'm president of the Central Council Click and Hide Indian Tribes of Alaska. Uh, it's an honor to welcome you. I just want to uh, thank all of you for coming. Uh, I hear yesterday was a really great day talking about uh, things that impact our region, uh, tourism being a big factor nowadays. I think all of you coming into Juneau see just how much of an impact tourism can be. These uh, We got some pretty big ships in and we see congestion and all those things. So we want to be on top of all the issues that are impacting our communities. <clears throat> um, I think as you see the agenda, it, it's pretty evident how impactful our tribes are here in Southeast Alaska. In all of our villages, it's our tribes that are doing the work, that are addressing the issues facing our communities, especially the environmental impacts. Like I said, we have uh, some big impacts from tourism, transboundary mining, fisheries, uh, you know, we're seeing a huge interest in our region for shellfish and now kelp development. And, you know, it's not that we're against any of these issues. It's that we need to be involved in those issues. We need to be um, at the table. We need to be in the meetings. We need to be part of the decision making process to decide what does or doesn't happen in our communities, in our region. And so, um, you know, recently we had a lawsuit from uh, a group in Washington state over the orcas. Um, and it was a lawsuit that said that the commercial trawlers couldn't fish and commercial trawlers is a, is a pretty sustainable fishery. It's one we support, one that has a incredibly strong participation from our tribal citizens. We found out that through this, that over, I think it was over 700 of the permit holders for the troll fishery are uh, Clink and Haida citizens. So that's not even all Alaska natives that might be participating. So I was really excited that all of the tribes in Southeast, uh, many of the corporations actually came together on that and we filed an amicus brief and we were able to get a stay, which allowed our fishermen to continue to fish this summer while this battle goes on. And it was pretty incredible to see the power of our tribes and our corporations come together. And that's not something we see enough of, is actually not only just our tribes all working together in a unified voice, but having many of our village corporations uh, lend their voice to it as well it was pretty incredible. It was ironic to me as um, Clink and Haida just re received its first uh, parcel of land into trust and immediately the state of Alaska sued the federal government over the right to put land at trust. And then the same attorney general for the state of Alaska sending us a, a note saying it was the power of the tribes that won the day. I think I'm going to put that up on social media as uh, the attorney general saying it was the power of the tribes. And uh, it's, a, it's a power that uh, some people don't like to acknowledge. And I think it's one that they need to see. Um, you know, Clink and Haida doesn't think we're the solution to the any of the problems, but we do think that we can be a support. And we think those solutions come from our communities and our villages. So. We want to be a resource to hold our communities up 
Uh, you see, uh, you're going to hear in the coming days uh, presentations on our uh, Seacoast Indigenous Guardians Network. That's something we're really excited about working. Uh, Ralph Wolf will be here talking about that. And you're talking about, um, I hope there's going to be presentations on a proposed uh, Southeast Stewardship Commission. Again, this is a commission we want to see. It follows the examples of the Yukon and and those in Western Alaska who put these together to have a powerful invoice and impact on fisheries in their regions. And as you can hear, we're very concerned about fisheries in our region. I think uh, if you know the analogy, miners used to put a canary in their coal mines and if it died, it told you that you shouldn't go in there because of the poisons. Well, I think our fish are our canary and we're seeing some um, pretty staggering issues around salmon return, uh, certainly herring and with our herring row fisheries. And I think they're our canary and we need to be paying attention. And I think it's our indigenous uh, traditional knowledge that's gonna guide us. Our, our folks have been stewarding these lands and resources since the beginning of time. Our people knew how to pay attention, knew how to read the signs and that knowledge is still there. We just have to recognize it and utilize it. And sometimes that means standing up and using our voices when people don't wanna hear our voices. And so we have strong leadership in our communities. We have strong leadership throughout our region. And it's important, I think, to unite those voices to have that strong leadership speak up loud and talk about what we feel is impacting us. And I think folks really need to listen. So I'm really excited that uh, this conference happens every year. I, I think, uh, again, our team does a pretty fantastic job and I wanna recognize Ray and all their team in our Native Lands and Resources Department for putting this together. If we could give them a big hand. And, and I heard yesterday, I, I missed uh, one of my favorite guys over here, Sir. I heard his mom's in the house. So I missed that recognition, but good to see you, sir's mom. Anyhow, I hope you guys enjoy the week. I know it's a really packed agenda. Um, I was talking to Ray about it and they try to cut it down every year, but so many issues are going on and so many people want to come and share that that's why it goes the full week. And I think that's a testament of coming together and sharing this knowledge and what we can learn from each other because everybody's doing important things in our communities. And, uh, you know, we share these ideas, we share um, knowledge. I think it just makes us stronger and our voices stronger. So looking forward to uh, seeing each and every one of you and uh, hope you have a great conference. Good cheese, hello. Thank you, President Peterson. Greatly appreciate that welcome. Uh, we're having a little bit of Zoom issues right now, but before uh, before we call up our, our upcoming presenters, we want to get let them get that fixed. Um, so I'll just kind of ramble on a little bit. <laughs> but to touch up on what President Peterson said about uh, this event being able to bring collaborative efforts together, uh, th this conference was able to help get the, the CTOR program going. And if you guys don't know what the CTOR program is, that's the harmful algal bloom um, set water sampling and shellfish sampling that the tribes do uh, throughout Southeast Alaska, thanks in part to Sitka Tribe getting that together, um, and also our transboundary project. So for those who don't know, when we do water quality sampling on transboundary rivers in each community, we invite those other tribes to be a part of that. And that that essentially was um, started through our, our Southeast Tribal Environmental Forum, formerly the Southeast Environmental Conference. So yeah, this, this forum has uh, been a, a great platform to bring collaborative efforts together to share resources and offset costs. So uh, I just wanna acknowledge President Peterson for that. Thank you. Uh, looks like we're good to go. A little bit more. Um, should I do a dance? <laughs> Thank you.
where's the music? <laughs> no, 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 I'm just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> it's in the head. <laughs> There's a lot going on in the head. Music's not it right now, too, but yeah. <laughs> no excuses. Well, I'll let all call them up anyway. It sounds like almost there. Um, so our next presenters, the, the title of this next presentation is Skywarn Storm Spotter Training. Uh, Aaron Jacobs and Nicole Farron with the National Weather Service will be given this presentation. Uh, it's a review on how to identify, evaluate, and report severe weather events in Southeast Alaska. Uh, they'll, they'll give that update. And thank you guys at the National Weather Service for taking the time this week to join us at the conference, and we look forward to your presentation. All right, well, thanks for uh, the introduction and for having us. Um, before, I guess, before the presentation gets up there, I'm gonna take a minute for um, a land acknowledgement. Gunish teach to the Clinket people for uh, the stewardships of uh, Clinket on Knee since the time memorial and to, to today. We at the National Web Service in June also knows the Hakthaheen acknowledged native lands that our office occupies. We are located on the traditional lands of the Aquan people. So I think we'll wait for the presentation to come up, but um, my name is Aaron Jacobs with the National Weather Service. I'm the Senior Service Hydrologist and uh, Nicole Farron is the Warning Coordinator Meteorologist for us here in Juneau. And I'm gonna be a little mobile here. I wanna keep this light and active a little bit. Uh, what we're gonna be talking about here is how you guys can help us help you essentially. And what I mean by that is that we need information from everyone in this room, regardless if you're in Southeast Alaska or somewhere in the lower 48. So first off, raise your hands if you live and play and reside in Southeast Alaska. Great. Okay, how about the ones who do not? You guys are also very important because we're gonna have two portions of this uh, presentation. One's gonna be a bigger kind of a, overall view of what the weather service like to do with um, how communities can really help spread um, our message or the hazardous weather to people so they can be um, ready, responsive, and resilient to any type of uh, um, extreme weather. And then there's another portion of this talk that's going to be more for folks in Southeast Alaska to really help us know what's happening in your community, gain, gain those traditional knowledge, uh, find out how much snow, how much rain, how much uh, water is uh, falling. And then we get that information and we'll be able to improve our forecast. So as we're waiting for the presentation to come up, I get to dance. I can dance too, so that's good. Um, so I've been in Southeast Alaska for about like 22 years. Uh, Nicole's been uh, at the forecast office for about like 12 years, but she uh, spent summers and uh, other times in uh, Haines uh, with her family. So we have a really deep connection uh, and understanding of uh, this area but we don't have everything. And that's where everyone else here can really help us um, know what's going on in your communities. Um, there are a map that'll be shown where we have information and it'll show a lot of areas that we don't have information. And all the information that we can gain from everyone else in this room will make those forecasts even better. Yeah, we learn from uh, the local knowledge, uh, You know, being here, forecasting here for over a decade. Every time I go to a new community, I learn so much about the area, but you've lived here forever. And so you are, can already give us that information and help us make the forecast better for sure. Yeah, great. So we'll talk about this first initiative that I'm trying to, uh, well, I'm talking about. So it's uh, called the Weather Ready Nation. And what we want is everyone in the world, in the nation to be um, weather ready. And weather ready is mean responsive, resilient, and um, so the other R. There's three R's. It's ready, resilient, and responsive. Responsive. There you go. And so we're good to go. And so with um, that, um, we use people who are um, help to protect life and property, and those are people that kind of be force multipliers. So. Uh, those people who want to take uh, on this information. So if you can go to slide two, please. And this is uh, an overall training that we're going to be talking about is a little um, 
compressed because of the time that we have, but you can get it all on our webpage and we'll have the link at the Next end. Slide. So this is the Weather Ready Nation Ambassadorship. And essentially we want uh, organizations that can help promote our messaging, help spread our warnings and uh, messaging from the weather and how that's gonna be impactful to people. So it'd be like force multiplier. So we send information to one person, then they send it to their community. So now not just one person's in the know to be ready, responsive, and resilient, but now we have all these other people to do so. And then the, the main service to help their community, help educate, um, workplace preparedness. And then you also engage with us personnel with the weather service. We help come into your communities, give talks like this, help understand the products that we issue. And then we share our success stories. There's a couple um, Weather Ready Nation ambassadors in this room today that has helped the weather service and helped the uh, communities be ready for stuff like this. So if you are interested in becoming um, a Weather Ready Nation ambassador, we're gonna have a, a forum kind of going around the, um, the tables here at the end. And if you want to just sign up and we can send you more information uh, about it. And that's primarily for anyone in Southeast Alaska, or even if you're um, in the lower 48, we can hook you up with uh, folks in uh, the forecast office in your area. Uh, next slide. All right, what can I control here? Maybe not. All right. So impact decision support services. So what is that? You may be asking. So what is that is essentially it's how we can convey weather information to our core partners and then they can make decisions to keep people safe. And so this is like one of a, a graphic that we would send out to our core partners of like an atmospheric river, how much rain is going to happen in the next 24 hours, what type of impacts could happen. Another one um, kind of like snowpack conditions where the water uh, uh, security, how much uh, drinking water for our fish, for um, for um, hydropower. And so we send out this type of information to our uh, our partners, and then, then they can make the decisions of how to use that information. And so how that helps us is being a weather spotter. So being a weather spotter helps us provide that impact decision support services to our core partners. And after today, after we get this talk done, everyone here will be a certified weather spotter. Isn't that cool? I'm excited about weather. I think everyone else here is pretty well excited about weather because it happens all the time. It's all around us. It happens. It doesn't stop. So again, we'll have a, a sheet going around. If you guys do want to have um, be a weather spotter and be able to provide information to the weather service, um, at the end of this, you'll be uh, able to do that. And Nicole will have a piece of paper that you can sign up and we can get you uh, set up so uh, you can provide that information to the weather service. And so um, what is a weather spotter? It essentially is a trained citizen, whoops, who reports any type of hazardous weather, any type of like, again, this is a talk who winds coming down here in downtown Juneau. It could be um, other uh, heavy snow. It could be how much rain, a landslide has took place. And so this kind of helps uh, what types of impacts their communities and the traditional knowledge and what you all can help us with boots on the ground can really improve uh, our, our forecasting. And so why, again, why are they needed? Well, you know, lower 48 is a lot. See all those little boxes? How many forecast offices are in the lower 48? There's our forecast area over the top of it. So you can see how much large, how much area we have to cover over for one, three forecast offices where the lower 40 has a lot. So there's a lot of land that we have to cover, three of the largest areas of responsibilities. And it's impossible for us to track everything. So we need everyone's help. And then local now. So all these dots are people who um, are signed up to be weather spotters, but you can also see that there's a lot of gaps, a lot of holes. And so if you're in any of these uh, areas that you don't see a dot or you don't see a lot of dots, please, it'd be great to have you as a, one of our weather spotters so we can gain that knowledge so we can improve this forecast. And so we have other observations. Uh, we have automated weather observations at airports. You can see the ones on the right here that measure wind, visibility, clouds, uh, temperature, dew point, um, but it's sparse. We don't have a lot, you know, we don't have a lot of uh, airports around. We don't have a lot of automated weather stations, uh, but we do have a lot of people in the communities. 
Um, and then forecasters need to know those details. We can't detect it if we don't know what's there. We have an idea there's certain um, tools that we do have, but ground truth is the most important. And like, so certain things that we can't detect, wind damage, snowfall accumulation, uh, flooding, we can know when rivers are certain levels, but when is that impacting you? Uh, thunderstorms, water spouts, when you're on the water, you see a water spout that could uh, um, impact you on the water. Ice accumulation, landslides. Again, why we need, uh, need, we don't have a lot of radar coverage. You see there in the Orca Island off of Sitka, we have one radar for the whole area. A lot of it's blocked on the, on the east side, so we can only see stuff that's coming off of the Gulf of Alaska. Still not very far, but it is something. But on the east side, where everyone's at, we don't really have a lot of rainfall information. And then safety, when we ask you to be this weather spot, we don't. We wanna make sure that your, your safety is our highest priority. We don't, we don't want you to get hurt or anything like that. So obey all the laws and the public safety, you know, don't put yourself in a harm's way. If the road is flooded, you know, don't step out into it. Take a couple pictures, take this a time, you know, uh, watch out for uh, down power lines, windy areas. And then, okay, what do we want? You know, what type of information are we looking for? So wind damage, flooding, landslides, thunderstorms, hail, dense fog. Is it really dense that you can't see the next car in front of you when it's only like maybe a hundred feet? Um, snowfall, the changing of snow, as we all know, doesn't always snow. It goes from snow to snain to rain, from rain to snow and back and forth. So knowing that times of when things changes really helps Nicole and I a lot, knowing how much snow is be able to accumulate and also learn we learn. So then we will be able to forecast it even better next time. And then blowing snow, you know, it doesn't really happen too often, but there can be times that we can uh, get some blowing snow that can reduce into a blizzard. Then freezing drizzle, freezing rain. Um, for folks in Klukwani, probably are a little bit familiar with uh, some of the, uh, the freezing rain aspects that we have um, seen in the past and in Juneau. So one thing is really hard to measure, snowfall. <clears throat> so the, ideally for snowfall, you like have a whiteboard, something that you clear off every day. And you can see it off to the right, you kind of see it's um, flat, nice surface. So then you have an idea where it's at, you don't lose it. Uh, you clear it off every day. and. Um, if you can make the snowboard level, you know, cold surfaces so it doesn't it's clear. Um, make it sure that's open away from trees, buildings, or fences. A clear area is really great. And then um, clear off the snow before and, and after the event, but not during the event. We want to make sure of how much snow is there during the whole time. And then using your snowboard or table, we want to measure measuring stick, you know, measure to the to the tenth of a of an inch. So we have an idea of how much snow again is there. Note the time of the onset and um, the end time of the snowfall. Again, that kind of helps uh, Nicole. She does a lot of storm reports. So she verifies our, our warning. So knowing when the snow started and the snow ended really helps her identify the time of that hazardous weather that time. And those measurements, you know, make them as ASAP right after events so because they're settling that can happen within the snowpack. So the sooner you can get that observation, the better it is. Uh, if you're not using the snowboard, if you don't have it, and you just want to uh, use your yard, you know, there's certain things to think about. Uh, you'll need to know the snow depth before the event. So go out there with a ruler, you know, take a couple measurements, see what that snow depth is. And then um, if there's wind, watch out for the blowing snow area because you might have some really, a lot of snow over on this side. But then you come over here, then it's almost like a little bit. I have that in my yard all the time. So I got to watch out where I kind of put mine. Uh, separately, you know, tell um, how high those drifts are. That's really important. So we know if it is that type of consistency, it's consistency of the snow, if it's lighter, heavier, it can get blown around and it can really create those uh, blowing, blowing uh, snow drifts like you see in St. Paul, uh, Alaska. Next, um, so, you know, other information that's really important is to determine how, um, how heavy, lighter, uh, moderate the snow is and from that you can see from how much is accumulating visibility is another good way to tell the intensity uh, from the light moderate to heavy you can see heavy snow is about one inch per hour less than a quarter mile of visibility um, usually we can use that from our airport so that's where you guys come in handy if you can tell us if it's heavy snow or moderate snow in say um, in Kassan or in um, in Kloak or something like that'd be really great to know those um, those uh, information uh, more on snow, right? So uh, again, really hard to do, uh, really important. So how much in the tire snow event? Um, is it currently snowing? Is it heavy, reduce any visibility? Uh, did you have any impacts, right? Was any uh, schools or roads uh, being closed? Was any events canceled? Again, this really helps Nicole out on how impactful that weather event was. 
And then um, is it an estimation or measurement? Try to avoid estimation snowfalls because that's really uh, enlarges or decreases our snow amount uh, from like other reports, but every report is important. We can always use reports, even if it's not heavy. So even if you only got like three inches or even an inch, that's even great information. Yeah, that helps us know that uh, it didn't snow there and maybe it was a miss or if it changed to rain already, say in cake, then we can tell Angoon that the rain's coming your way and maybe cancel their warning a few hours earlier based on uh, someone else's report. Yeah, very true. Uh, and so we're going to leave snow. I'm going to quickly ask any questions, please. Questions are good. Okay, start with you. We haven't gone to that one yet, but that's a great question. On snow, I guess the questions on snow measurements, how to measure snow. We have a couple questions. Go ahead. Uh, we They use our information, then they um, use their expertise in snow sciences to figure out if it's a high, medium, or low threat of avalanches. So we provide the weather information and any type of the observational information, but they have the expertise to say what the risk level is for avalanches are. White uh, reflects the sun, and so it doesn't get heated up, you know, like a black car or something would melt the snow faster. Uh, how do you measure the snow differently compared to like snow that's like wetter, you know, like slushy snow? You know, it's it's all the same, snow is snow, but the consistency that is very different in like from a, like a wet, heavy snow to a cold, drier snow. So that's what you're mentioning is more like the water equivalent yeah. of the amount of water that's in that snow. And that's um, if you take a measurement of the snow and then you have uh, a tube, you can melt down that snow and to find out how much water is in that snow. And so that's a very important aspect for avalanche forecasting, for flood forecasting, to knowing how much water is in that snowpack. So measuring the snow depth is all the same, but how much water is in it definitely would change in that uh, situation. And if you tell us that it's slushy, wet snow, we know it's probably not going to add up as fast and probably wouldn't need a advisory or a warning in that case. Yeah, that's very so that's really good information. Like part of um, what we're going to like, what type of information we would want to see. That is some of the information would be like, is it heavy snow? Is it light snow? Because that kind of goes back into our impacts. If you know you have six inches of heavy snow, you know your back really hurts after you're done with it. But it's nice fluffy snow, you know, it just goes right around. So th it is a big um, uh, factor. It's something that we would want to know. It helps us with the understanding. And if uh, we, we try to include that information with our core partners, I talked to uh, snowplow driver in uh, Gus Davis all the time. And he likes to know if it's going to be dry snow or wet snow because he's dealing with the airport and he can use the broom on with dry snow to clear the runways a lot faster. And so if he already knows that that's the kind of equipment he can use ahead of time, it's a big help. And so we try to include that information to our city officials. Nothing. Nothing. That's the environment. That's a you trace. lose it. That's the trick. Sorry, go ahead, Nicole. I was going to say it'd be a trace of snow. Uh, you know that snow fell, but you couldn't measure it. And you can mention that in your report. So you can say, hey, we had snow, but it all blew off my board. And that's important information, too. And that's what makes snow measurements so difficult and so important. Because of those couple of factors, like between the wet, heavy snow and the very light stuff that get blown away, it's so hard to measure it. And knowing that information helps us do all the other work that we're trying to do within the environment. You know, the snow, the water, everything's all connected. And you'll see we give a range of snowfall amounts in our forecast. <laughs> uh, that plays a factor. Yeah, microclimates, microclimates, microclimates. As we know here in Juneau, and I'm sure folks will know from uh, from uh, 
POW or the people who are, are from Cake or or from or Klaquan, they totally know that if you go this valley, you get this much more snow. If you go to this valley, you get like this much less snow or temperatures or, or precipitation. So that really makes our, our job a lot more difficult. And so again, that's why so much your information is so important. So we know what's happening in these other places that we don't have observations for. So freezing rain, freezing drill, it is not uh, prevalent in Southeast Alaska, but it does happen and it can be pretty hazardous when it does and we want to know when it's happening. So it's when uh, liquid precipitation that falls and then freezes on contact. So that's when we have the very like cold outbreak, you know, everything's been really cold, grounds frozen, all like the, the asphalt's frozen. Then we start getting this light precipitation, a little warmth, but still cold. We get this uh, kind of uh, freezing drizzle that you can see on the car here in Mendenhall Valley. So they kind of form on vehicles, buildings, trees, and pavements. Uh, I've only seen some really, really significant freezing rain event where you actually see the accumulation form on the trees and you really get that nice crust around it. And that can be really dangerous for electric companies and trees falling down. So it can be very dangerous uh, in that aspect, but it, it is a rare access, more of the the drizzle, a little glaze ice, and that can make the driving conditions very difficult and hazardous. Um, so includes the timing, uh, again, onset, when it, it uh, started and ended, and please call us uh, when it ends. Again, hazardous road conditions from freezing precip, any damage, you know, down trees, broken power lines. Um, and can you measure it? You know, get a, a ruler out, and is it, how thick is it? Is it just a glaze, or is it a little bit greater than that? Then sleet, um, and sleet reporting, you know, sleet is a little uh, precipitation that falls through a warm layer and then passes through a freezing layer, kind of refreezes and kind of have these little pellets and little like um, balls. And uh, it's not hail, you know, there's a little bit other stuff that it's a different process, but there's a little bit difference with hail we'll talk to in a minute. But then uh, includes sleet in your report, you know, again, the time, the onset, if there was any hazardous conditions that was associated with it, is it accumulating? And that also helps Nicole and I kind of figure out where we're at in the process. Is it starting to warm up more? What the whole atmosphere is doing up above? So these little um, changes in the, from a liquid to a frozen uh, precipitation type really tells us as meteorologists a lot of information about the uh, status of the atmosphere. Flooding. Everyone likes flooding. Not necessarily. Sorry. <laughs> um, it happens. It happens a lot. We get a lot of rain here. But our environment can also take a lot of water in southeast Alaska. Uh, but you can't get flooding like this. this is uh, from Galeno's uh, ice jam flooding that um, devastated their community in 2014. And essentially, overflow is uh, into normally dry areas. It's typically where you don't have water. Water gets into that area. Um, waterways such as river streams, drainage ditches in the fall time, you know, a lot of our drainage ditches can rise, can start overflowing in uh, poor drainage areas. Um, these are the common uh, causes of flooding in Southeast South, heavy rainfall, atmospheric rivers, glacier dam uh, lake releases, um, snow melt interaction. So like in the summertime when we have really warm temperatures and then we have some really warm um, precipitation, we get a lot of snow and ice melt on our larger rivers. Rain on snow, those are can be really um, troublesome ones uh, when we get heavy rainfall in like November and December on top of a fresh snowpack and we're able to melt off that snow very fast on top of very heavy rainfall, we can really cause some uh, some flooding that takes place. Uh, some of the less known, but they are possible. You know, we do have some coastal flooding potential along the coast of uh, Yaktat, Sitka, and Kloak and Heidelberg. And then also the tsunami risk, um, not just on the coastal areas, but also inland uh, from maybe like um, submarine, uh, the hillside falling down like in Latuya Bay. Very, very rare, but it is possible that it could take place. So this is um, snow melt. What's snow melt? Um, ice melt flooding. So it's usually it's in the spring and summertime. Uh, can be enhanced um, if there's still um, if there's the ground still frozen. Uh, in in Fairbanks, they've had uh, problems like that in their springtime with a lot of snow melt in April, but the ground still frozen. But for us, it's more uh, uh, for a snow melt would be more on the the bigger river system like the Taku, the Stikine, the Chilkat, uh, and then some of the other uh, systems in uh, up in the northern Panhandle that has a lot of the glaciers too. They will kind of see their higher uh, peaks and uh, potential flooding in that time of year. Hot, hot, sunny day in the springtime. 
yeah, exactly. You may, we like it and all, but we get them for a very long time. We get a lot of runoff. It can cause some problems as we've seen in the past. Now this, uh, uh glacier dam outburst floods, they are in the news lately, um, from what happened here in Juneau, but, uh, um, they are causing more and more havoc, uh, in other places where we haven't seen before. And, um, they're going to continue into the future, but this one, um, they're pretty much what happens is that water is being held back from a main stem glacier. And once a water gets to a certain level, it actually lifts that glacier up and water is able to flow underneath it. And as that water flows underneath it, this whole orifice gets larger and larger through time as the water is melting that ice. And so that's why you can see those hydrographs, they kind of start slow and then they really ramp up. And the real problem with those, uh, those events is that, um, uh, it's so hard knowing how much volume of water they're in it and how much can come out at one time. What happened here in the Mendenhall and the Suicide Basin was we saw the most amount of water come out at one time and so cause um, major flooding and damage. But these events happen elsewhere too. They have it up on the Taku uh, down there and then also on the Salmon River uh, down near Hyder. Uh, and then there's a couple other ones across the state. But we deal with them here in Southeast Alaska. And then here's some impact pictures from uh, some previous uh, flooding events in uh, 2011 and 2016. Uh, flash flooding. Um, we can get flash flooding in a sense of heavy precipitation in a short period of time. Our heavy, our flash flooding is more um, kind of tied to um, landslides and debris flows. Uh, our flash flooding doesn't really act like what we think like in the, in the uh, in the southeast, uh, lower 48, southwest, where you have like no water, then all of a sudden you have a wall of water. Our water in our rivers, they can come up and they continue to come up. And so our flash flooding is more of the heavy precipitation over a short period of time, but it's more because of our uh, complex terrain. We see more of these, uh, not as much of these uh, canyons and urban tents, but more of the debris flows and uh, heavy precipitation really um, getting the soils uh, weak, very steep terrain, some wind can get involved. Okay, and how do you report? What to report? Again, you know, what type? What caused it? Um, what's the current weather conditions? What were the impacts? You know, were any roads over the roadways? Was the trail inundated? Uh, was any mudslides or landslides that took place? Um, and if possible, you know, if it's safe, you know, can you get a ruler to find out how deep that water is? Um, all this really help us understand the impacts uh, of these rivers we can know what rivers get to a certain level but we don't have any flood stages we don't know what the impacts are so knowing those impacts is really important so when we do put out a forecast for any uh, rivers it's not just that one river it's really a river that gives an idea for the rest of the area we don't have a very big uh, gauge network for rivers so we use ones or twos or threes to get an idea of what all the other ones are kind of doing in those similar river types so knowing the, the uh, conditions, what type of flooding you're seeing, what type of impacts, and again, and when it started is really important to note that. Wind, you know, we see a lot of wind in the fall time and winter time around here, especially on the coast. Here's some pictures uh, from Matt Lakella of a, a hurricane force uh, low that came up and uh, caused havoc down there in 2018. And so high winds of damaging trees, property structure, power lines, uh, if the power goes out, that kind of helps verify some of our high wind warnings. Here's a, it's, it's difficult to estimate. So we have this um, wind estimation of different wind speeds to certain, uh, um, what you would see, like uh, large branches, like 25 to 31 miles an hour, large branches in motion, whistling heard overhead, umbrellas used uh, with difficulty. Um, and knowing uh, some of the reports to be coupled with uh, intangible evidence, like garbage cans blowing down the street, down uh, uh, tree branches. So but once you start getting into this colored area, that's when we start issuing like any type of a high wind watch or high wind warning for the weather service. And that's when really some impacts can start seeing, seeing. So like 55 to 63 miles an hour, small trees are uprooted, structural damage can occur. Uh, October First, 2021. Who's here in Southeast Alaska or Juneau during that time? Yeah, really big wind event, right? Really strong low pressure systems. We had those types of winds, 55 to 60, or even as high as um, 64 to 72 for over six hours. There was massive amounts of damage across the Juneau area, lots of trees down. Fortunately, my house was one of them. But this estimation can really help us know how severe those winds are and what type of impacts we can see. So being able to report 
trying to estimate, okay, if you can't know the wind speed, hey, we're seeing um, branches being snapped, or hey, I have a shingle from my neighbor's house in my yard. You know, that's all really important information that we can really yeah, glean a lot of information and put out um, if we didn't forecast that. You know, knowing that information, like, oh, we have to increase it. We might have to actually look at what are we missing. So it's not only of validating our warnings, but also situational awareness. So our forecasters know what's happening in your communities. Severe weather, it's rare. We do, don't have it too much, but we do have some thunderstorms. We had a thunderstorm go over Juneau uh, this past uh, summer. They are accompanied with hail, strong gusty winds, uh, lightning, funnel clouds, and a possible tornado of a silver land. Uh, we do see thunderstorms. They are rare, but we can see them as more along the, on the Gulf Coast, but we do see them. And then here's criteria between if it has to severe, it has to have a certain amount of hail size, gusty wind, winds at 58 miles an hour, if you see a tornado. Uh, lightning is not part of severe criteria, but let us know. You know, it's, it's something that happens and we want to know when it is taking place. And so if you're down south and you hear that there's a severe thunderstorm warning, th that's the kind of information that they're saying could happen. So it, that's pretty important to take shelter if you're down south and hear a severe thunderstorm warning. Yeah, if you are in the lower 48, um, heed to any type of uh, severe weather <laughs> warnings from the National Weather Service. And then hail, right? You know, hail, you'll see that a lot more down in lower 48. So if you are in the lower 48 and you will be a, a skywarn train, um, training trainer after this, um, yeah, please report hail. You know, if it's greater than, a, than an inch or an inch, uh, we'd like to know about it. Uh, compared to other options, objects, right? Pea size, dime size, nickel. So that all, like grapefruit. That's all that we want to know because that tells us a lot again about the structure of that and strength of those storms. Funnel clouds, you know, here's a picture that uh, old coworker took uh, over um, the Kenai Peninsula. So they do happen in Alaska. They're not just something that happens in the lower 48. Uh, they're not common, but they do, uh, they can happen. And then you kind of can see, you see a lot of Wilwas though, right? You know, like in the cold area and the Takus or even um, I was up in Klukwan at a uh, workshop last week and we were seeing little Wilwas up going up the Chilkat River with all the, the winds coming up. So they're not common, but you know, we can see um, this. And I think Wilwas or Gustnados are going to be in here soon. Tornadoes, again, rotating, column of air, extending up from the base. Uh, here's one in Alaska, you know, Sand Point. Um, so they, they do take place, um, but they are uncommon for us here in Southeast Alaska. Rain shafts, you can really see where that heavy rain is really coming down. So it's not a tornado, it's just a lot, it's like almost like a thunderstorm collapsing on itself where the whole thing is just falling down in this just big rain shaft just Heavy, heavy rain just coming right down there. And this is uh, one in Anchorage from uh, 2014. Gustnados. So this is one coming down from the Mendenhall Glacier here where there are short-lived vortices that kind of come down from, uh, from a cloud and like a tornado does, but may or may not look like it. Please don't report these. They're really cool to see, but yeah. Hey, Aaron, can you repeat the question on the mic? I have, a, I have a mic here. I was just, hello. Can you, uh, do Gus NATO's, can they just be like invisible, but you feel them when they go by? Yeah, they, they just pick up some, if there's some dirt around, they'll stir up some dirt um, or over water, some sea spray, but you might, if there's not any dirt there, maybe you won't see it. Some leaves blowing around. Not dangerous usually, though. Yeah, like uh, what we were seeing on the Chilkat yes last week. You know, if there wasn't no dust, you wouldn't have seen it. But they're always there. And like Nicole was saying, uh, the reason you can see it is just because it picks up some type of um, dust or debris and stuff like that, or snow and that. Of course, and it, and it and it's not really like quote unquote tornado weather because it's not coming from a cloud, like a, a water spout's coming from a cloud. This uh, slide here, actually, that photo is from where I went to school in uh, Oswego. Um, that's Lake Ontario. So not a southeast Alaska water spout, but that's what it would look like. If you're out on the water, you would see a spray ring um, at the surface and then uh, the cloud extending down. 
typically in Southeast Alaska, they're fair weather water spouts. And I use quotes there because um, it can still be dangerous. Like you don't want to drive your boat into a, a water spout, but they're not formed like uh, regular tornadoes in a thunderstorm. These ones are formed more commonly in our area when we have a cold air outbreak, like really cold air, uh, cold air flowing over our warm water. That's what can create a water spout. And we definitely want to know about them. And pictures, you know, paint a thousand words there um, and help us know. And we would actually, based on your report, we would call the Coast Guard and they would relay that on Channel 16 immediately. And so that'd be important for other mariners to know. Here's another uh, picture of a water spout. Ah, How are okay. we doing on time? <laughs> I think we're over. <laughs> we're almost done. Just a little, but we got a late start, so. Great. Uh, so I know a lot of people in Southeast Alaska, we have boats, kayaks, and so on. So being a marine weather spotter is just as important as being a land spotter. And so what we would want folks to report if you're on the water is like the wind speed direction, wave height, uh, swell direction. We don't have any actual buoys that tell us wave heights in the inner channels. We have certain models and we have certain rules of thumb, but we don't have any type of measurement in the inside of the buoy. So information that we can get from all everyone who's on the water is so valuable for us to understand how that wind is affecting the wave highs with the currents. And so freezing spray accumulation in wintertime, dense fog, how dense is it? What's your visibility? Uh, anytime a previous mentioned conditions from, from this presentation, what, so what, like any of those conditions we're talking about, like what to measure? Um, when which can you sniff different from our forecast? That helps us understand if we were right, wrong, and how we can learn from it. We're all, we're all in this together. We're all trying to use as much information so we can learn from it. Then seven components of when we want that better report on our web page, and we'll go to the web page in a minute. Uh, there's this uh, little icon. So you click on that icon and it comes to the spotter report page and uh, we'll have your name. Um, you, after this talk, uh, Nicole and I will be able to give you a, a spotter number. We'll know your location. Um, you would want to put in uh, the location of the hazardous weather, the type of hazardous weather, time, duration, and then um, any other contact information if we don't have it already. And so submitting it, again, you could, um, we're there all the time. There's people right there. There will be someone there later on tonight. Don't hesitate to get in touch with us. You can call us. Here's the phone number. You can email us. You can check our storm reports, you know, go and um, you can see what other uh, storm reports are out there. You can um, go and submit one yourself. Um, there's a social media handle. And um, then there's Nicole giving a briefing um, to uh, the forecast staff. Thank you very much for your time. Every single person here is now a trained weather spotter, but this was a, um, a, con a compressed version. The more uh, more detailed version is right down here at the weather.gov Juno Skywarn. If you guys have any questions, Nicole and I are here to answer them right now. One. You only have 30 seconds. <laughs> And you can you can go to that website too and and see the full um, presentation, and and if you leave something out, we're not you're not going to get penalized. <laughs> it's okay. I'm sorry. We're going to have to save questions for later. We're running a little behind. Yeah, yeah. Just go to that website or come see us. And there is a sign up form on the website too. If you if you miss getting to sign up officially with us, uh, you can do it later on the website. Thank, Thank you everyone. so much. And uh, we'll have a sheet going around. So please sign up. Great to hear from all of you, especially everyone in the surrounding communities. Thanks again. Thank you, Aaron and Nicole. All right. Ron and Annette, are you guys ready? All right. Thank you, everybody. Here's Ron Hines from the Six Sound Science Center. Thanks. Thanks.
Uh, thanks, Gunashish, um, for the opportunity to give for this opportunity for us to share the work that we've been doing uh, in Southeast Alaska, and, and we'd also like to to thank the uh, thank the people for stewarding this beautiful land. Um, what I want to talk about today is the uh, project that we've been working on, the Tukte project, which is uh, we're in year two of a five-year project. And um, it's a geohazard monitoring project. And uh, our goal here is to help communities adapt to uh, events associated with extreme precipitation. And we're right now, in, uh, we're working with six communities in the region. We're working with Huna. Kwakwan, Skagway, Yakutak, Craig, and Kassan. Uh, the project that we're doing is based on our experience that we developed in Sitka. So in 2015, there was a, a fatal landslide in Sitka, and the community convened a geo task force to try and figure out how they could prevent the, that sort of uh, problem from developing in the future. And that led to uh, a group of sci an NSF funded project that's National Science Foundation funded project where scientists came in and held a series of workshops with the community to understand uh, how the community felt about this landslide hazard and how people communicated uh, landslide hazards to each other and to develop a method for maybe reducing the risk that people would feel from landslides. And the way it worked is uh, through, like I said, through these uh, iterative meetings and a co-design process where there was research done, it was presented to the community, the community then weighed in on the research and commented, and then that went back to more research and it went through a, a process that ended up with a, uh, an application that you can uh, get on your telephone where you can see what the current landslide risk is in the community of Sitka. Uh, and what it's going to be over the next uh, 72 hours. And, uh, and we rolled that uh, application out last year. Now, what we didn't, as we are moving forward with this Clutip project, we didn't necessarily want to provide a landslide application for every community, although maybe that's what we will do eventually, but we wanted the communities to tell us what the, what the hazards are that they see in their communities and then work, and then we can work with them to try and develop uh, some sort of system then for them to have situational situational awareness uh, for when those uh, hazards might be a problem for people in the community. Uh, so, like I said, we might not necessarily be interested in in a community. We may not necessarily be interested in landslides. Uh, and as we've met with communities, we've learned a lot about flooding in communities. We've learned a lot about erosion, the impacts of erosion, say, on salmon habitat. We've learned about avalanches. Uh, we've learned about uh, other climate and other impacts on ecosystem services provided in these communities. And um, But I have to admit, everybody puts landslides right up there on the list. Landslides seem to be very important. In Southeast Alaska, which makes a lot of sense, we get a lot of rain and we have really steep landscape. Uh, and this is a partnership, like I said, between scientists and the community. So uh, we have scientists from a variety of organizations. Uh, the Sika Sound Science Center in Klinka Haida are uh, uh, basically running the project. And then we have scientists coming from uh, up and down the West Coast. Uh, that are coming up here to Alaska and meeting with members of these communities. And we're also uh, working very closely with uh, state and federal agencies as well. Um, and so because we bring, we have this wide variety of people working, we bring a lot of uh, skills and perspectives to the work that we're doing. So we, yes, we have atmospheric scientists, but we are also working closely with the tribal natural resource departments because they're the boots on the ground. They understand how the land works in their community. We're working with elders who have the perspective of time. They, they, they know how things have gone and how things are changing over time. We have hydrologists, geomorphologists. We're engaging with students, high school students in a lot of communities through our outreach program. 
we're working with uh, with meteorologists like Aaron, who's just up here, and municipal employees and homeowners as well. So we we try to gather perspectives from all of these people, and and we can then mutually design systems that are helpful to these communities. So before we go much further, I want to uh, talk about uh, there was a an atmospheric river event just uh, in southeast Alaska about two weeks ago on Saturday the twelfth. This figure here shows uh, some of the climate con or the weather conditions in Sitka on that day, and um, the middle graph there is precipitation. And this, if, does this laser work? Yeah. And if you look uh, in the middle of the day, there we're getting up to 0.4 inches of rain, uh, and so this actually led to uh, uh, our landslide application, resulting in a moderate landslide risk. Um, but what I want, would like to do is I would like people to get together here for a few minutes and, and talk about this event, if you remember it, and uh, think about what you saw and how you reacted to that event. For myself, I, was, I went to a, uh, a 90th birthday party that day and got really wet walking from my car to the house, the party. And the thing that really concerned me is it was, uh, I was worried about the heavy rainfall kind of beating down my potatoes. And, and uh, the plants were kind of getting beat up by all the rain, and I really should have staked them up better. Um, I was also worried about some windows leaking in my house. So those are the kinds of things I want to know. We want to know if that you're concerned about. Maybe you were concerned about flooding. Maybe you were concerned about a landslide. That's possible, too, certainly in Sitka, that, that we had a moderate landslide risk. But if you could take, uh, just talk with the people near you uh, about this event for a few minutes and uh, and maybe somebody in, in your group of people uh, might want to report on what you learned uh, from that discussion so that we can get a sense of the, the kinds of things that happen throughout the region uh, during an atmospheric river event. Then we'll kind of go around and have people report on what they discussed. So I'll give you about uh, five minutes. So. Who would like to volunteer some things that they observed or uh, thought about, maybe were concerned about, or thought was a good thing from the atmospheric river. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Not everyone at once. Not everybody at once. Up oh, here we go. Just happened to be sitting by Huna people here, so we kind of focused on Huna and the vision that the villages are surrounded by clear cuts, and so we're always surrounded by hazards on the roads that serve us now to get here and there to get our food. We've lost more access. Also, we're thinking about Juno. I live now below Thunder Mountain, so there's always that too worrying about that you know look at the what's happening in general this is these are hazards and it's not going to stop this atmospheric mountain is you know basically we need tools common tools in this region like it says here what tools do we have available to us in the communities all together so that we can have the independence to react as well as help others around us in crisis and what tools do we have already in place you know that's the question that's a great question and uh, i mean so we're dependent on the weather service for a lot of this stuff um, but jason oh Oh, there's a question here. Oh, it's a comment. I was concerned about my cousin's family and other friends that live along the Mendenhall River. Right, and then the following weekend, we had a, a big uh, glacial outburst flood on the Mendenhall River. It displaced a lot of people. Uh, I think a sentiment at our table was we all felt really grateful for rain. Uh, after a lot of sunshine, the sun's been amazing, but, um, you know, the moss is really dry, the forest is really dry, 
we're all really dry and it's uh it feels unnatural um but we were talking about you had mentioned positives that came from it and i think it's scary when we see rain events that can be so disastrous so deadly happening maybe more frequently but then the rain that the forest needs that the environment needs happening way less frequently and consistently Well, I think um, over in Cake there, we don't have too much landslides in their community, but we have landslides like Kuna that are out away from town on logging roads, and sometimes that'll affect our ability to get from one area to another. But we do have a, a road crew. The tribe has uh, three three men that go out and, and grade the roads and uh, patch up the roads if they get washed out or whatever. So our crew basically takes care of Sea Alaska land, Cake Tribal land, and the Forest Service. So, and that's just a, a service that we do for our own people. We don't do it for anybody else. We just make sure the roads are safe. But that downpour, I remember it now. I thought I didn't remember it, but sitting in my house and all of a sudden I heard the yeah, just a torrential downpour and I walked out and looked out and and that thing was coming down thankfully we didn't have any washouts from that thanks yep, over here I didn't have any personal experience because I wasn't there, but I feel like you know could listen and report uh, some interesting stories. So from a plant being in rehab um, and to like leaky cars to a leaky house uh, to just another day at the office where you know didn't stop her from picking berries. So um, one of the things that I thought was neat was mentioning salmon. Kind of liked it that uh, they could get up a creek that they couldn't normally get up and the bear maybe had a harder time uh, getting to them. So um, I, I I wasn't prepared to hear positive things about uh, you know, disasters or extreme events. And that was really nice to hear that there are like positive effects beyond the human uh, condition there. We had one over here and then I'll go left. Hi, good morning, thank you. Well, last night at the Committee of the Whole, the Juno Assembly was, uh, I didn't listen to the meeting. I was too busy doing other things. And they were go going to be talking about adopting the hazard maps that Tetratech, which is a very large international company, did. After the Haines slide, the city hired Tetratech to come in and do uh, hazard maps of our town and we live in a town that has a lot of gullies and slide areas a lot of water coming down a lot of rock slides and the danger i live in a house that's over 100 years old and it's still there but you know it doesn't mean that a slide from above wouldn't couldn't affect my my house the, and the other problem it seems to me is that our city has continued to so allow people to build on hazardous slopes and uh, build an, uh, floodplain, the floodplain of the Mendenhall River. And so, I mean, it's, it's sort of like we all know human beings just don't seem to have a very long-term viewpoint. Most human beings don't. They're not thinking about what things are going to be like 100 years from now. But I really think our city has to be responsible about this because there are public safety issues. And I don't know what the city decided last night. I'm sure I'll find out. But um, that's, you know, the, the slide in Sitka was disastrous. I mean, it was devastating. And there was loss of human life. And same with Haynes. That was disastrous as well. So that's all I wanted to say. I think we had one more. Uh, Carol, did you have a question? 
Yeah, so um, when, when that happened in our community, it had been quite dry because um, we had a landslide in uh, 2019, I think it was January 1st, it wiped out our road. So we had to do, um, we had to go around the logging road um, to get to town, which was 17 extra miles. Um, but um, on Saturday there, uh, it rained so hard, it what my husband called blew out the rivers. The rivers were blown out. We couldn't go fishing. It was just, you know, but we were thankful for the rain ourselves because we do catchment. So, um, yeah, it was a lot of rain all at once. Great. Yeah, those those are great observations. And, and uh, it's true. We live in a rainforest and the rainforest depends on rain. So sometimes we get a lot of sun. It's kind of nice to see the rain come back. All right. Um, so 20, uh, I'm, I'm giving an update on our project. 2022 was a, a warm and wet year in Southeast Alaska. So this graph on the left is the annual precipitation uh, from 1990 to 2022 in Sitka, Ketchikan, and Juneau. And the thing to just see here is that in 2022, Juneau had a record amount of rain and Sitka didn't have a record amount of rain, but they had a lot of rain in general. And this graph on the right is the uh, average daily temperature uh, for the high temperature uh, averaged over the month for the same three communities. And we can see that in 10 out of the, in a, if, if it's a zero, that means it was average. And if it's a positive number, then it was above average. And you can see that in 10 out of the 12 months, uh, the average daily high was above average in Southeast Alaska. So it was a warm, wet year last year. And uh, as far as landslides in Sitka, we did not report any landslides in Sitka in 2022, although in October, we did observe a moderate risk during one of the storms. And it was a pretty average year for atmospheric rivers as well, as I understand. It was about 100 or so that made a landfall in Southeast Alaska, and about maybe 12 of those were severe events. So uh, it's in that, uh, sort of context then that we've started working with communities uh, on, on this project. So in Huna, uh, we actually made uh, started meeting with people in Huna over a year ago uh, last summer, and uh, we got a good tour of some of the landslide issues in the community and, and met with people in the community to discuss other problems associated with extreme precipitation. And so this summer, we uh, started mapping uh, to learn about mapping the sort of uh, the geology of the region in more detailed maps so that we get a better understanding of the geo geological context. And we're seeing lots of limestone and karst. And so limestone, that's, you know, what makes these caves, you see these big caves and there's a lot that's generally this because it's limestone. And uh, so that has a big effect on the way water flows through the landscape in the, in the community. And so uh, what we're trying to do is uh, build these maps, identify where the limestone and karst is, overlay that with the locations where we know where landslides are taking place. And so we get a better understanding of where these landslides are occurring and, and what the geological factors that are initiating them. And then that'll help us fine tune, uh, helping the community understand when and where they might encounter these kinds of issues during rainfall. We also started working with students in the uh, Huna community through our outreach program. We have a we have these devices that are called weather chimes. I'll talk about that in, in a few in a few minutes. But we were able to put a few of those out in the community and start recording stream temperatures and stream height, air temperature, and soil moisture. And, and this is data that students will use uh, in their high school classes. Uh, Skagway, we, we went to Skagway and met with the community about just about a year ago. Last October, we were there and we learned a lot about uh, flooding in Skagway. There's a lot of flooding issues in Dye, and then also with the Skagway River itself. But the main concerns people had had to do with the rock fall uh, above the cruise ship dock there in Skagway. There's a picture of it right here. Um, a rock fall is a type of landslide. It's not necessarily the debris flows that we're thinking about that affected, say, Haines or, or uh, Sitka, uh, but it's a different type of, of landslides, harder to predict the conditions. 
Uh, but we know that the community is worried about rock falls. And if you look in this picture, in the lower, the lower picture here, you can see that there's this long, steep ridge alongside the community, not just above the cruise ship dock. And so it's likely that there's also potential rock falls all along that ridge line. So we conducted a, a LIDAR survey in May. And what that does is it allows us to kind of look at the, the hillsides without any brush or trees on it and make a map. So we can see where, where things are really steep, where there may be big blocks that are starting to tip away from the from the uh, uh, ridge uh, that might pose a hazard for the community. We're gonna follow that up with a seismic survey in September. And the seismic survey will tell us how deep the cracks are behind those rocks and how much the rocks are moving. So they'll give us an idea, it'll give us an idea of the scale of the hazard that exists and, and uh, better define what the hazard is all along this ridge, uh, this Eastern Ridge uh, in the city of Skagway. And uh, so that's kind of where we're at with our work in Skagway. And in Klukwan, we just came back from a meeting in Klukwan. Uh, as we met with the community in Klukwan, we learned that people there were very, con the, the, the tribe was very concerned about where we might want to put housing in the future. And uh, Klukwan is in, a, in a, unfortunately for Klukwan, is in a very interesting place geologically. So it's built on a debris fan. So a debris fan is when there's a debris flow that comes down and all the rocks pile up at the bottom. Uh, Clock One happens to be built on the base of a famous debris fan uh, for the uh, 23 mile slide on the Haynes Highway. So this is one of the most active uh, landslide fans uh, that the Department of Transportation deals with throughout the state. The community is built on this fan, and it's hard up against the Chilkat River, which is also eroding the banks of the community away. So they have concerns about where is the, where is the safest place to put any new housing that they would want to put into the community. So what we did is we brought a bunch of geo, uh, geoscientists into the community so they could talk with people from the community and learn where landslides are taking place, when landslides have taken place, how how bad is the flooding? Where do they see the flooding? What kinds of conditions exist when the flooding is there? And together, uh, between the scientists and community members, we were able to draw an overall hazard map for the community. It shows where we think flooding is likely to continue to occur in the next 20 to 30 years and where we think landslides are likely to occur. And, um, and Hopefully the, the community will be able to use this map and then we'll be able to go back and, and work with, continue to work with them and, and uh, refine the work that we're doing. Um, we just started working with three other communities. Uh, we learned at the first year of our project that we couldn't really deal with all six communities at one time because uh, there's only a couple of us that are managing the project. Uh, but we learned that Yakutat's an amazing place uh, there's a lot of concern there uh, about flooding on the road to the dangerous river. Uh, we learned that tsunami warnings in Yakutat are very difficult to hear. Not the whole, the whole community doesn't hear the sirens when they go off. So there's a lot of issues with making sure people are warned in the community. Uh, there's a lot of concern about landslides and erosion in Monte Bay. And that is potentially going to impact the, um, the AML dock there. And uh, so obviously if you can't get Alaska Marine Lines into your community, that's gonna pose a problem for the community. And there's also issues with the quality of the drinking water in the community. So we're planning another trip, a site visit to Yakutat in the fall. So far we've just met with them by Zoom and telephone and uh, but we plan to get to the community this fall and maybe look around and, and get a, a more specific direction and a, and a sense of the priorities of the, the concerns that they have. Uh, Prince of Wales, uh, we're working with Craig and Kassan, but maybe we're maybe we need to kind of expand our scope there on Prince of Wales and work with other communities. But we met with uh, representatives uh, from uh, uh, Sean Seat when we were there, uh, and that went down there in, at the end of July. And these representatives from Shanxi took her around. She saw lots of landslides, was able to start marking them out on maps uh, in, uh, on Prince of Wales. 
uh, our GEO scientist in Oregon, Josh uh, Roaring, has a graduate student who's been mapping uh, landslides using satellite imagery, so we can tell sort of when those landslides might have occurred because, you know, as using these serial uh, satellite pictures, and these are high-res pictures, and then the information is going to go into the Forest Service's Tongass Landslide Inventory. Um, and, and getting timing information on landslides is important because, as you can imagine, there's a lot of landslides on the, on the landscape here that we don't see or maybe we see long after they occurred, so we don't really know when they happen. And if we know when landslides occur, then we can think about, well, what were the climatological conditions that were taking place at the time that that landslide occurred? And that can help us refine our ability to predict uh, landslide potential in the future. So we, I said we have an outreach program, and uh, that's uh, being headed up by representatives from Oregon State. And we have some people here uh, from Oregon State. And they have this uh, device they call a, a weather chime. And uh, what it is is it's a, a series of sensors that you can that students can put out, and it'll measure things like soil moisture, air temperature, stream height, stream temperature, those sorts of things. And then what the, the data then are held in a database and they can call that data back up. And then instead of visualizing the data, they can actually, um, they can make songs out of the data. And that's, uh, that's what Oregon State is helping them do. It makes it a little bit more interesting way to think about the natural environment. And uh, this was actually picked up. There was a, a nice story on, uh, that went statewide on Alaska Public Radio uh, about this, the device and the work we're doing in HUNA. They also, we also worked with the Sitka High TEK class and put the same devices out to monitor conditions for yellow cedar in Sitka. Um, they also held a workshop at Whale Fest last November and are planning another workshop at Whale Fest this November. And so if you have students that you would like to get to Whale Fest or maybe learn about how we can use these devices in your community, you should let me know after the meeting, after this talk. Um, and then also we have uh, use storage and HUNA helped with mapping so that some of the local geology there. And then this year, uh, this uh, we have a surf. This is a scientist in residence, uh, Deanna Nash, who's our atmospheric scientist, is going to be uh, based out of Sitka and can make trips to other communities. But she'll be uh, here for the month of October where she can interact with communities directly. And as far as atmospheric rivers are concerned, this is uh, Deanna's work. This kind of applies to the region as a whole. That's why I put that here. Uh, and basically what we've learned here is that, uh, well, atmospheric rivers, first off, here's a, an image of the, this is a 2012, 2020, uh, December 2020 atmospheric river that hit Southeast Alaska and, and led to the vents in Haines. And it's a narrow band, uh, the atmosphere that transports water vapor from the tropics, uh, to uh, to make landfall in North America, and as as Deanna pointed out to me, Southeast Alaska is kind of unique, uniquely situated to collect lots of atmospheric rivers. You kind of look at us; we're sort of a corner in the Northeast Pacific, and so we we capture lots of stuff that moves across the Pacific. Uh, the factors that influence, and she's working on a classification system so that we can have a better sense of how severe atmospheric rivers will be when they come to Southeast Alaska. And so the things that they've discovered that influence their impacts are the strength and duration, the direction from which the atmospheric river comes to your community, whether or not there, if it's a rain on snow event or if there have been multiple events in a row. And the other thing, she's gone back and looked through the, the, uh, the climatological history of Southeast and determined that, that there's about 120 days a year where we have atmospheric rivers making landfall in the region, but only about nine of those produce somewhere around 75 to 90% of the per extreme precipitation we get. So relatively few events, but they're all really extreme uh, in the region. So that's the uh, some upcoming activities. Uh, we're gonna continue learning about geohazards with the communities, working with communities will be spending a lot more time out in the field. I think Annette's tired from her two-month field season. <laughs> um, 
we're going to develop, and then uh, we recently got some more funding from USGS to develop a plan for data management, which should facilitate access to information about landslides and, and, and improve our ability to couple that information with uh, environmental data, things like rainfall, stream discharge, soil moisture, those kinds of things, which right now it's, you kind of go, got to go to a lot of different places to get that information. And we want to create one stop, stop shopping for all of that. And that'll provide researchers and community members with a much more easier access to hazard related data. And we'll hopefully provide some uh, interpretive projects, products like the landslide app for community. So you don't have to be a geoscientist in order to understand what these data are telling you. And then we also are going to develop a training program. The idea there is so uh, agencies can contact people in local communities to uh, service their instruments and keep those data streams flowing so there's no interruption in the information. Um, and all of that is thanks to USGS. And so that's the update. Uh, that's where we're at. And uh, let's see. Oh, we're only running five minutes late now, so I think uh, a break is scheduled next, so that should make everybody happy. And if you have any questions, uh, you can ask me, or you can ask Annette, or you can ask Jason. I guarantee you both of those women know much more about the project than I do. <laughs> Thanks for your time. All right, we are going to go into a break. We're going to do a 10 minute break to get us back on track. All right, everybody. Here is Christy Wallace in the Alaska Volcano Observatory. Thank you. Maybe. Check, check. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, okay, hello. Well, we're going to switch gears a little bit here and talk about something that you're probably not used to talking about in Southeast Alaska, nor am I. Um, I have been at the Alaska Volcano Observatory with the USGS for since 1997, so a super long time, and been studying, everyone can hear me okay? Studying volcanoes and mostly the Aleutians, um, but uh, what I'm going to be reporting on, on today is some activity at Edgecombe Volcano, so uh, not other volcanoes in southeast. We know there's lots of other volcanoes that are old, and some might be sort of young, but I actually don't have a, a lot of knowledge about those because they're inactive. Um, but specifically at Edgecombe, um, I'll be reporting on what's going on there. So. I'm gonna back back out a little bit and sort of tell the whole story because I know not everyone in this room is familiar what's, with what's been going on. Sorry. Oh, okay. So let's see, um, some things I'm gonna be going over and I've interjected a couple of slides throughout just to stop and um, ask questions. So uh, there will be some opportunities there. So I'll talk a little bit about what the Alaska Volcano Observatory It is and what we do. Um, just a background on the tectonic setting of Mount Edgers. Some plans, studies, and paths forward. Um, and then the next, the last part, I just want to talk a little bit about unrest. Um, if unrest were to lead to an eruption, what to expect. So I won't get into a lot of details only because we're not there yet. And if we do um, see other types of information that suggests that an eruption will occur, we would have a lot of community outreach and give you all that information. I just didn't want to overwhelm you here. Uh, so yeah, just a little bit about preparation for an eruption and then um, how you, you can sort of stay connected. Oops, going the wrong way. Okay, so just to kind of orient you to the Mount Edgecombe Volcanic Field, which is that MEVF, that's kind of been a, a long-standing name of this volcanic field. Most of us think of Mount Edgecombe as the volcano that's got the arrow pointed at it here, that it looks like a perfect sort of Fuji-style uh, volcano. But in fact, the 
um, volcanic field is quite extensive. Let me see if this is going to show up. Yeah. So uh, the Edgecombe volcanic field makes up the southern part of Prusoff Island, and there are dozens of vents. Um, about 50% of the vents are on on the island and about 50% of them are in the submarine environment. So it's quite extensive. Many of them are just these tiny little cones, little cinder cones, you can see those flank both sides of uh, the central volcanic area here, which has created the, the bigger cones of Crater Ridge, which is here, and also Mount Edgecombe and the, and the biggest eruptions have come from, from these vents. Um, there's also a progression of age, the older, Older vents are, are out here, and the younger vents are sort of in the middle. Okay, so um, the Alaska Volcano Observatory, I, I always put this slide up because when we come to your communities, you might get confused, and we don't want you to be confused. Um, we have always been a consortium of three agencies. So the U.S. Geological Survey, who is my employer, I work in Anchorage, but also the University of Alaska Fairbanks Geophysical Institute and the Alaska Department of Geological and Geophysical Surveys. Since the beginning of ABO, we've always been these three entities and we work together as a family. We call ourselves the Alaska Volcano Observatory. And, um, but sometimes, you know, the agency names come out, DGGS, USGS, UAF, we're all the same. We're all working together. So that's the important thing. So the, the Alaska Volcano Observatory has three main objectives, um, monitoring and conducting scientific investigations, um, assessing volcanic hazards, understanding volcanic hazards, and then using that information and sharing it with the public so that they can prepare for and mitigate um, hazards associated with eruptions. Okay, so just a quick background um, to put things into context, because again, we haven't spent much time working in Southeast because the volcanoes haven't been active in recent times and in historic times, um, which is in Alaska when the written records are kept, which of course doesn't really mean anything when you have an oral history, which is much, much more extensive. So um, here we are in the um, Pacific Ring of Fire. So you can see the uh, Pacific plate here, the earth is made up of a bunch of plates, and then the boundaries of all those plates are where all of our volcanoes are, and you can see that uh, Edgecombe in this southeast area is along a plate boundary, uh, as well as the Aleutian Arc, where we're monitoring a, a lot of volcanoes. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I'll hold it closer, thank you. So this is just kind of a different view of it, a cross-sectional view, where you can see that this Pacific plate is subducting beneath the North American plate, in this case, or a continental plate, and uh, those volcanoes form in that tectonic setting. Okay, so Alaska has a lot of volcanoes and potentially active volcanoes. So there's Lots and lots of dots on here. Some are red, which means uh, eruptions that have happened since the written record, which is the definition of historical. So since 1760 in Alaska, which again, doesn't mean a whole lot. There's been a lot more activity that is um, recorded in the oral history, but we don't always have access to that information. Um, and then a lot of eruptions that have uh, happened in recent times. So there are about 180 volcanoes that we're uh, monitoring and uh, about 54 of them have had historical eruptions. Um, and then a few over here in, uh, in Southeast as well. So this is just a quick visual of some things, uh, highlights of what's going on right now. Just a couple weeks ago, there were seven volcanoes that were at elevated color code or active or showing some signs of unrest. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we've taken a few of them back down to sort of background levels. Those include Great Sitkin, which is having this lava flow that continues to grow um, uh, since 2020. Uh, Trident Volcano is experiencing similar activity to what I'll describe at Edgecombe, which is um, earthquake activity and then an inflation, so magma moving into the system. Um, Trident is in the Katmai cluster, so near Katmai Volcano, which you may recall has experienced the largest eruption in the 20th century in the world. 
Um, and so lots of earthquakes going on there. And then this is a picture from just a couple days ago, two days ago, uh, at Shishaldin Volcano, which is um, has been erupting since July 11th. Okay, so again, a little bit of background on the tectonic setting. So here we are in Southeast Alaska. So we're uh, right along the Fairweather or Queen Charlotte Sh Fault and Kruzoff Island where Edgecombe is, is just um, inboard of, the, of this fault by about 10, 10 kilometers. All right, so to give some background on what what we're seeing in April of 2022, there was an earthquake um, detected by the uh, regional um, network that we don't maintain. Um, the Alaska Earthquake Information Center maintains the regional network and there was an earthquake detected and um, we heard about this and looked at it to see, okay, well, what is that? That's interesting. Normally we would just assume that it's tectonic. So just those plates moving and running into each other or running past each other create a lot of earthquakes. There's lots of earthquakes in this region. Um, but someone asked, and so we took a look and discovered that there had been a swarm. So a swarm is just a lot of earthquakes happening sort of all at once. So this is the Sitka uh, seismic station, again, managed by the, um, Alaska Earthquake Information Center for tectonic earthquakes, not volcanic earthquakes. And we went, uh-oh, something's happening there. So in response to that, we did a retrospect re retrospective analysis by going back and looking at all the earthquakes since uh, between 1990 and, and the current time. At the time, it was 2022, and realized that. So this is showing all earthquakes, all of these dots, different sizes, including the tectonic earthquakes. Um, and you can see that there is a cluster of earthquakes uh, right around, uh, this is Kruzoff Island and here's Edgecombe here, but there was this series of earthquakes um, that actually had been occurring since 2019. So it had been going on quite a long time and we were unaware of it because it's not a monitored volcano, meaning it doesn't have a geophysical monitoring, um, any, any monitoring on the volcano itself. So these were being picked up by distal stations that are out there to look at tectonic earthquakes. And so uh, getting good locations is really impossible with those with that network because they're too far away from the volcano. But even with that network, network we were able to see um, that there was a significant swarm and earthquake activity going on since 2019. Uh, here's just the current status of, of earthquake activity. So what I just showed you was this swarm that we could see in April of 2022. And then since then, um, earthquake activity has tailed off quite a bit, uh, but still continues at a relatively low rate. In response to that earthquake activity, we're also always interested in whether or not a volcano is um, changing in size, so inflating. In other words, is magma moving into that? In, why, are, why are the earthquakes happening? Well, often it's because magma is moving into the system and breaking rocks, and breaking rocks means earthquakes. So in order to look at that, um, we used uh, satellite INSAR, which is um, just a tool for the satellites are moving over the Earth, and they're taking um, measurements of the Earth's surface in at two different time periods. So one day and then the next day and then the next day. And if there's any change in the surface, so it's mapping out the surface in great detail. If there's any change in that surface, then an infra there's an infra interferogram here, which is this colorful um, um, figure. And that just shows the phase difference. And that helps us to see how much has changed. So sometimes it means inflation or deflation. Um, it just depends on, on what's actually happening. So we did a retrospective analysis of, uh, of these data and found that um, Edgecombe had in fact been inflating and the center of inflation, so the greatest inflation is the red area and it's lesser towards the green. So out here in this reference point, there's no inflation and it gets more and more in the area right underneath uh, Crater Ridge and um, Edgecombe proper. And that inflation actually has been occurring since 2018. So you can see that inflection point here, nothing, 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 nothing. And then right at 2018, we started getting inflation. 
And the total inflation since then has been uh, 20 inches. So that volcano is 20 inches taller or bigger than it was um, prior to that. And that relates to uh, or equates to about four uh, inches a year. OK, so what does it all mean? So together, the earthquake activity, so the breaking of rocks and the ground deformation um, suggests that magma is accumulating inside the volcano. And that magma body can only be modeled at this point using that INSAR data and the earthquake information, although the earthquakes aren't going to really tell us much at this point because they're not well located because the there's not a good network. There's no good seismometers really, really close, and you need them to be close to model. So mostly the deformation um, model suggests that there's kind of a pancake-shaped um, body, magma body, under the volcano that's about six miles deep and about 10 miles broad. Okay, so just think of it as kind of a, a pancake sitting under there and kind of tilted a little bit. And uh, this information suggests that um, it could lead to an eruption, but it doesn't always lead to an eruption, and I'll give some examples. Okay, so here's just a few local Alaska examples um, of, of similar activities, so mostly the inflation. Um, Semisipachnoi was inflating at similar levels between 2014 and 15, then it stopped inflating, Three years later, it began erupting. So there's an example that could happen. Um, Akatan, there were many events through all of those time frames um, that never, er never resulted in an eruption. Uh, the picture over here shows ground cracks where one of the events in 1996 at Akatan was so significant, it was much more inflation than we've seen at Edgecombe. Uh, lots more seismicity and actually ground cracks at the surface, but never erupted. Uh, Pulik Volcano near Katmai, uh, same thing. Similar inflation did not lead to an eruption. So there's just a number of examples here um, that suggest that inflation at a volcano, magma moving into a system does not always mean it will erupt, but that is why volcanoes erupt. So we have to pay attention. So the bottom line is here, it could Unrest could end, it could continue, it could escalate, um, but that the most recent eruptions from Edgecombe are small or have been small. Okay, so what would we expect if this unrest, this inflation and relatively low earthquake activity right now were to lead to an eruption? Well, we would absolutely see more earthquakes because this volcano hasn't been active in so long, um, the rocks are solid and therefore they would, they would break and make earthquakes. That's not the case for a lot of our volcanoes in the Aleutian that erupt often. They're kind of hot and juicy and they don't make earthquakes and so we have to use other types of data to monitor them. Uh, good news at Edgecombe is there will be uh, earthquake activity if that magma continues to move up into the volcano. We'll also start to see heat coming from the volcano and you can uh, see that by satellite data, which we look at every day. Uh, you could also do uh, local surveys, which we have the equipment to do. Uh, gas, um, also you can see in satellite and you can see in doing in local flights. Again, we have a program that does the gas uh, studies um, and we would continue to see change in deformation. The good news about volcanoes, unlike earthquakes and other hazards, they often give us lots of warning. And at a place like Edgecombe that has not been active for a very long time, we would expect lots of time, years potentially, um, but certainly uh, weeks or months. Okay, so I wanted to stop there and just see if there's any questions so far. Um, and then I'll start sort of talking about uh, volcano monitoring. Uh, was like six miles down what where do the think? other ones were surfaced? Does that indicate tectonics or does that indicate like like a magma pressure? 
Well, let's see, the earthquakes that we plot there, we think are related to magma movement and not to tectonic move, you know, movements of the plates. Um, that's a really good question. Because there's not a, mon a geophysical monitoring network on the volcano, those locations aren't great. Um, so it's really important for us to have nearby instruments. And how we do that is we put them right on the flanks of the volcano. And that will um, allow us to better locate earthquakes. And then we'll have a much better sense of whether or not the earthquakes um, should map out the location of the of the uh, magma chamber and should be consistent with the model, um, the inflation model, but not so much right now. Yeah, great question. I just had a question about uh, underwater volcanoes. Are you starting to see those? There are lots of underwater vents, um, for sure, associated with, with this volcanic field. Um, none of them appear to be active. And for the most part, what we do know about um, this volcanic field is the the flanking volcano, so the northern and the southern sections of Edgecombe are older. They erupted long, long ago. And the more recent volcanism comes from the center of the island, which is Edgecombe and Crater Ridge. Yeah. Um, I didn't mention this, but people often have questions. Um, there are a lot of hot springs in the area of Baranoff and, and near Kruzov, and they are unrelated to the Edgecombe volcanic field. So if you see those, because we're asking a lot of people to make observations, and um, but we are aware of those hot springs, and they are not associated with this volcanic field. Other other questions? Okay. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about volcano monitoring. Um, the Alaska Volcano Observatory has been uh, doing volcano monitoring for over thirty years. Um, these are the kinds of things, tools that we use, um, satellite, we, yeah, we do a lot of remote sensing. Every day we're looking at remote sensing data to monitor. It's actually the only way we can monitor all the volcanoes because we don't have them all instrumented. Um, it's very costly and every year we have to go visit those stations to, to do repairs and change out batteries and things like that. Um, but putting seismometers in the ground, here's an example, and uh, I'll show you some pictures. Um, but really, it's just a tiny little seismometer, but we have to build a lot of infrastructure around it to uh, manage, to deal with weather and bears and uh, and all, all the things. Uh, GPS is a way, so I talked about INSAR, which is using satellites to measure inflation. Um, GPS on the ground will also do that same thing, so tilt meters. Um, and there's some ground-based and air-based gas measurements that we can do. So most of our stations, we try to co-locate a camera. Uh, we've not done that at Edgecombe, but uh, often we'll put in a whole station, and a station is completely off the grid and remote, right? So it has to be powered. So we'll try to put as many instruments as we can at one station. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, let me see. Talk about some other things. Um, so in addition to sort of some of the geophysical tools that we use in the remote sensing, uh, we're also using geology and geochemistry, and I'll I'll talk a little bit more about that. That's my um, area of expertise. I'm a geologist, and my focus is volcanic ash. Um, and then of course we so depend in Alaska on eyewitness accounts. So from people in your communities. Um, pilots flying over mariners um, are absolutely the most critical observation tool that we have because we are not there. We're sitting in Anchorage and in Fairbanks. So we really value that. So this just kind of gives a perspective of um, how much monitoring and experience we do have at the observatory. And all of that is in the Aleutian Arc because those have been in the past the active volcanoes. So we have two over 200 monitoring stations on those volcanoes. Any one volcano, we wanna have at least three stations to locate earthquakes, but some of our volcanoes that are very active or near community centers, we might have 14 stations. So we have a lot. Um, and then the colors are just indicating the different types of instruments at any one station. So we often have um, seismometers in the ground, um, GPS, those are our two standard tools and those are really good for forecasting um, eruptive activity or unrest because they tell us that something is 
leading up to or going to happen. So it gives us a sense of unrest and allows us to provide some warning. There are some t detection tools like infrasound. Infrasound is a way of detecting explosions. And in the past and today, I guess they still use that for infrasound can detect um, bombs anywhere in the world. Um, but they're also turned out to be really great for detecting uh, explosions at volcanoes, even bubbles bursting at volcanoes. So they're, they can be very sensitive. But that's a detection tool. It's already happened. So at places that we don't have good monitoring, um, a detection from an infrasound network, which is always a regional network. For the longest time, there was just a network in Dillingham and in Fairbanks, and we could detect explosions anywhere in the Aleutians, but it takes a while for that wave to make it up to those locations, so it's maybe way too late. Um, but we now have uh, infrasound networks near you know, many places along the arc so that we can pick those up more, more quickly. Okay, so just a reminder of what volcano seismicity is. So here's some of the different sources of seismic signal. So explosions from volcanoes, breaking rock, lahars, um, any kind of uh, pyroclastic flows. The most significant right now at Edgecombe is just this breaking rock from this magma moving up and pushing the other rocks out of the way and breaking them. We also can see helicopters. Um, we got a, a funny report from the Coast Guard. They sent us a picture of, of one of our seismograms and uh, said, oh, something's happening. But we knew it was just them landing at the site. Uh, <laughs> Um, so our seismologists are really clever, and they can tell the difference between all these types of signals, including rock falls and explosions. And um, there's another kind of seismicity that's actually really telling, and it's called tremor. And um, it's kind of fluids moving in a pipe. So you can imagine putting your ear up to your water pipe and hearing kind of a So it's not breaking rock. But that's when you start to transition from rock breaking to tremor, that's an indication that you're getting closer to an eruption. So we've got lots of um, tools to really help us see what's going on. Um, and then GPS. So I'm telling you about these two tools because these are the tools that we're putting in, um, have actually just put in at Edgecombe. Um, so deformation I've been talking about, which is our uh, main indication of unrest right now. Um, we're putting in ground instruments that look like this. This is a GPS monument, and so it's just um, precisely oriented. And let me see if there's this will go. Okay. So there's just an example of how you know magma is pushing up through the volcano, and it's changing its shape and size in response to that. And the tilt meter is able to tell us that. So it's telemetering the data through satellites and back to the office. So we're getting all of this information in real time, which is a lot faster than getting it from a satellite. And also a satellite doesn't do well with snow and ice. And so this is a great way of, you know, it's anchored right to the ground. So this is our preferred method. Okay, so monitoring status at Edgecombe. As I said before, there weren't instruments on Edgecombe. Um, in response to the activity in 2022, we got an emergency permit um, thanks to the Forest Service to uh, put in a single station on Crater Ridge, and that's the location right there. Um, the idea there was to just put in something, um, even if it was for a few months, to start to see, well, what's going on, and what, you know, if there's more activity that we could detect. So that included a seismometer and the GPS, those two things I just talked about. Um, and just a reminder, there is the regional seismic network, but it's, you know, more than 15 miles away. And many of them are more than 50 miles away, so not super close to the volcano. There's a web camera in Sitka. We love web cameras. They look under the clouds, and often it's cloudy. Uh, there's a regional infrasound network. We're always using satellite data. Um, lightning detection, that's a funny one, but often when volcanoes erupt ash, they make lightning. And so if we get a lightning detection, then we're always looking to see, was there an explosion? And in Southeast, I don't know how common lightning is, so it may not be the best tool, but in the Aleutians, it almost means an ash cloud. And of course, again, eyewitness accounts, super valuable. Okay, so here's the Sitka webcam, belongs to FAA, super valuable, looks straight at the volcano. Um, this is that station that we put in. It was a temporary station. It's not how we would normally do it. Um, we started out with this very temporary situation. We came back a couple months later. So this was May, and then a couple months later and hardened it. 
because we wanted to leave it out over the winter. Um, and this is just an example of a little seismometer. It's maybe, you know, this big, just a little, little coffee can. So all of this just to, just to deal with that. Um, and then all of the other seismometers are very far away from cruise off, which is right here. Okay, so this summer, um, I'll just march through some work that we just completed. In fact, today is the last day of the project, and so folks are still out there. Um, I was there last week for five days, um, participating as um, doing the geologic work. Uh, but the main project and the main um, focus was um, was the instrumentation. Uh, so, you know, actually the all of these things were really important, but the, the main focus was uh, community engagement was a huge part of this project um, because we're in a place where there's a lot of people and a lot of interest. And so um, we've been really thrilled with how much, um, how much interest there is and support for doing this work. Um, often our volcanoes aren't really near so many people. And so it's been really exciting to, to be in a community near, near Sitka and, and in Southeast. Um, we wanted to install more instruments. One instrument, uh, you can't locate earthquakes with that. Um, do some gas work, because as I indicated, if things start leading towards an eruption or if that magma starts moving up, we're gonna start to see gas and heat when, when we wanted to do some surveys there. Um, we also wanted to measure some water temperatures. There's been um, some reports from locals about bubbling water, so we wanted to look at that. Um, and a few other types of reports. And so we wanted to kind of follow up on, on local observations um, and then do some geologic studies and reconnaissance. Okay, so yeah, community outreach. Um, thanks to Jason Schmidt who's, Schmidt, who's right here. She helped us so much. She's like the ultimate connector. Um, over a couple of different visits to Sitka, we had so many interactions with the community. Um, it was, you know, unbelievable. We spent time in the schools doing public lectures, public Q and A's. We hosted a um, a movie, uh, did an interpretive hike to look at some of the ash ball deposits in Sitka. Just trying to. Um, answer any questions that the community had. And that first visit, most people were really concerned about, well, what's gonna happen? You know, is it gonna erupt? And then a year later, the questions kind of changed a little bit. The community's interest was more in the science. You know, what's happening at Edgecombe and how do I better understand the science of the volcano? And that's just really exciting for us. So less, less worry about it erupting because a year had gone by and nothing happened, but we wanna continue with this type of engagement and, and um, especially if this could take a while. We want people to be remembering um, and making observations. So thank you for Jason for helping us to make all these connections. Uh, the instrumentation was the main focus of the work. Um, so we just completed, uh, all the stations are in now and I have some photographs. Uh, so we added three more stations. Um, and the reason we chose to center them around Edgecombe is because of that inflation source is kind of right in here and so we felt like that was the best instead of putting them too far far out on the island um thank you so much to the forest service um to the sitka tribe of alaska and to clink and haida for your support in obtaining this permit it was significant this kind of work has not been done on edgecombe and it requires installation of you know of equipment so it took a while, and um, I think everyone's going to be really happy with the monitoring of the volcano. So thank you, thank you for, for all of your support. Um, but the idea there is, yeah, we're going to be able to locate the earthquakes um, and, you know, detect more of them. So this lower picture here is a, one of the seismic stations. So you can kind of see the footprint. Um, it's about a 10 by 20 foot footprint. Uh, and everything is enclosed within this hut here. So there's a bunch of batteries. Um, we don't have a webcam at, at this particular, at any of the sites there, but, but basically all the communications and the batteries are stored here and then there's cables running underground in between them. So it's sort of an engineering feat to um, make these instruments run year round, um, all you, you know, with snow and rime ice and all the things, um, but that's that's something our, our tech group does really, really well. And um, 
Let's see. So here's some pictures the guys sent me from just last night. So the stations all went in in these muskeg bogs. Um, there's not a lot of bedrock exposure at Edgecombe, almost anywhere. And so uh, these end up being really nice places where they had to dig down through the peat, which isn't very thick actually, because underlying everything here are pyroclastic deposits from past eruptions. Um, but this is just some examples. We have, you know, making, putting in the GPS monument, you know, a lot of welding. Um, each of these sites maybe took a day and a half. Um, we had perfect weather, it was incredible. Um, pounding in the, uh, the monument um, into the ground. Uh, all, all of the huts were flown out via helicopter from the Sitka airport. But in the end, this is the footprint. This is what they look like, the, the pictures on the left-hand side. So just the hut with solar panels on the outside and the GPS monument. And all of the peat was cut out carefully and then replaced back into its exact notch. So it, it looks really beautiful. Um, if you like huts. Okay, so some of the gas and thermal work that uh, the crew did on the island um, included going to some bubbling ponds that were noted by uh, local observers um, and sampling those. There was a little bit of work done in June and there was some indication that those gases might be volcanic. There was a question, are they volcanic or are they biogenic? Just bubbling up rotten things. Um, and because there was a suggestion they could be volcanic, um, this trip uh, last week they wanted to do um, mercury analysis and so they did that yesterday. And that data it won't be available right away, they have to do some analysis. Um, but while we were in Sitka this last week, we also found out about a possible fumarole. So someone noted near a beach, uh, a cavern, which they'd seen for many years, but the cavern was whooshing a constant warm air that smelled like sulfur, which was very interesting to us. So a lot of the gas work was um, directed by the community observation. So we really appreciate any observations people ma make. And in this case, we were able to go out and, and figure it out. Uh, in the case, I can report on a few things. In the case of the the whooshing possible fumarole, uh, none of it ended up being volcanic in, in signature. Um, and might have been just old lava tubes and air was sort of gushing through there, but nothing volcanic there. The other big project was to fly around the volcano. So here's a picture. Um, this is a, a track flying around the volcano concentrically, measuring gases from within the crater, looking for any possible vents or hot spots or hot areas, but also any diffuse gassing, degassing on the outside of the volcano. Um, also, walking around the flanks and just monitoring um, diffuse gas by uh, using this sort of coffee can shaped tool where you just set it on the ground and it passively, you know, anything that's coming out of the ground gets collected and analyzed. And so we won't have those data for a little bit. Um, let's see, show some pictures. Okay. So this is uh, sampling from the bubbling ponds here, Claire. This was going to that sort of fumarole, this crack in the ground that was wishing and doing the multi-gas where they were able to say no, no volcanic signature. And here's their actual track. Uh, did a lot of detailed flying here and um, they were able to report this data right away. So no snow, which is good because it's hard to see. I mean, if gas is trapped under snow, you wouldn't know it. But in this case, there was no snow. Uh, no surface mani manif manifestations of degassing. I'm quoting these guys exactly. They just sent this to me last night. Um, so no additional craters or vents, no recent ground alteration. And the gases we're looking at are um, hydrogen sulfide, the H2S, sulfur dioxide, and carbon dioxide. Um, all were at background levels. So this is a major observation. This is a really good uh, indication that um, nothing is going to happen quick. Okay, so the geologic work, um, just, to, just a reminder again, there's a lot of vents here and the older, the, out, the northern and southern parts of the island um, have the cinder cones as well as the submarine events and they represent eruptions from a very long time ago and then it gets younger towards the center of the volcano at Edgecombe and Crater Ridge. And it's a very unique volcano in that it has erupted 
the entire ar array of volcanic uh, compositions from the Hawaiian type basalt all the way through the most explosive, we call them rhyolites. And I have examples down here of, of the, the end spectrum plus the middle is a, is a day site um, from Edgecombe actually. So um, please feel free to come up and they're labeled and touch them, um, see what they feel like. They're, they're pretty interesting. So um, our job as geologists is to try to understand what the current unrest is telling us. So can we look at the rocks that have erupted through all those compositions? So actually the physical rocks that you're looking at here today, we have used these. They were collected in the 70s and 80s by USGS geologists. And we were able to reobtain those samples without revisiting the volcano. And we're looking at melt inclusions in these rocks to help understand the storage conditions. So in other words, where did that rhyolite sit just before it erupted? Was it at the same depth, six miles, 10 kilometers or 10 miles wide? Was it deeper, was it shallower? And how quickly did it come to the surface? So there's a lot we can learn from just looking at the rocks. So we're doing that with all of the different compositions that have come out of the volcano so that we can say the current inflation looks most similar to whichever one, okay? So what we know from the geologic work that's been done, and it's a lot of work that's been done, and we're very thankful for that, um, is that the Clinkett oral history is actually filling in the gaps that um, we don't have in the geologic record. So if a deposit isn't preserved in the record, then we have no access to that information. So we're thankful for the oral histories that have been shared with us um, from folks in Sitka that have helped us to better understand that there have been some more recent eruptions, um, but that they are much, much smaller than the past big eruptions that we see down here, um, the samples of. And ultimately, this leads to helping us be better informed about possible hazards, because at the end of the day, the question from you all is, what should we expect? What kind of an eruption is it? And that's the kind of information we want to provide. So here's a geologic map. They're always very colorful. They all the colors represent different rock types. So the point here is lots of work has been done. And we're just, in this case, this summer, we just wanted to go back, revisit a few places to get more of the same material at known locations um, to do more modern analyses. And so that's kind of the main focus of the work. Um, here's just an example of the big eruptions that have, have occurred. Um, they happened between 12 and 14,000 years ago. So this is just an outcrop. That's a two meter section right there. So very significant um, pumice fall uh, has occurred. So this rock there is this big. So an example of something very, very large and not something we really expect to happen today. Um, based on oral history. So because we wanted to better understand, okay, well, if, if it's not all big eruptions, what does a small eruption look like? So we went to these peat bogs, which are everywhere, um, and we started digging down. So it's just about a couple of feet of, of peat, and you can see there's some deposits in there. So this is really close to the volcano, and it's just a fine ash layer. So it's quite possible that um, this would not have been very impactful. And if it happened today, it would not be very impactful. Um, and uh, we're trying to get some dates on this to get a better chronology of you know, the more recent eruption history. Um, and again, you know, hearing the stories or the tellings of the stories um, through oral history suggests that people didn't think they needed to move far away because it was erupting, but they could just move to a different part of the island. So they weren't super worried about these kinds of eruptions, the pictures I showed you before would have been uninhabitable. I mean, that, that couldn't have happened. So those older eruptions were much, much bigger. Um, and we're just trying to understand what could happen, the smaller eruptions or the bigger eruptions. I just have a couple more slides, but are there any questions about, about that monitoring? OK, so just a couple of slides. Again, I don't want to uh, get into too many details, because if it doesn't happen, you'll probably just forget all of this. But take home message is, if an eruption happens at Edgecombe, it will be explosive. Doesn't mean there might not be lava flows, but it doesn't really matter. Lava flows aren't going to impact anyone. 
ash is going to impact. So the most significant hazard from actually all of our volcanoes in Alaska is volcanic ash. And so what am I talking about? Um, here's a scanning electron microscope picture, a, like a 3D image of um, volcanic ash. And it's just sharp fragments of rock, volcanic glass, and minerals. And it's produced during explosive eruptions and carried downwind. Okay, so it can be quite extensive. And what are we, 92 miles away from Sitka? That's super close when it comes to an ash cloud. Um, so the whole of Southeast could be impacted depending on wind direction from an eruption of Edgecombe. And that's where Nicole and Aaron come in. <laughs> uh, we work closely with the Weather Service on, on, on ash clouds. Um, here is just our number one hazard in Alaska isn't ash fall to the ground on humans it's and, and animals in the environment. It's really to aviation. Um, Anchorage uh, Airport is the second largest air cargo airport in the world, which means all of these lines on the map, their flight lines, uh, are flying over all of our volcanoes. And this map isn't great because it's cutting out um, southeast, but there's a significant hazard to aviation. And so that's a, a big focus for the observatory. There are other hazards um, that you probably know about, lahars, um, mud flows, pyroclastic flows, all of these hazards stay proximal to the volcano and we don't consider them to be significant from Edgecombe. Um, and if it were a winter eruption, there may be more uh, flowage deposits and, and we would be uh, uh, working with the weather service to warn of, of those things. But the most significant hazard is really from volcanic ash. So that's kind of the take home. And then for now, the only thing we want to share in terms of hazards and, and preparedness is, um, again, volcanic ash can be impactful to transportation, infrastructure, human health, as well as all the cascading effects of planes not being able to travel, bring people and supplies in or out of a community. Um, in terms of preparedness, just think of it like building your emergency kit that you would have for any other hazard. And with COVID, we all are well aware of and have masks now. Um, those used to be not, not available during eruptions, and that's the number one thing that you would want to wear during, a, during an ash fall. Um, and then listening for volcano notifications. We've got a whole interagency plan. Um, like I said, we've been doing this for 30 years, so we have a playbook for all of the partners um, in eruption requires a village in Alaska. And so everyone has their part. And I am working with um, Klinkett and Haida, um, Sabrina Boone at Emergency Services to modify that plan specific to Southeast because it is different. The weather service office we'd be calling is, is here in Juneau. It's not the Anchorage office. And we'd wanna be working with um, tribal emergency management. So we're already working on those things starting last May. So um, we're really thankful for, for those opportunities. Uh, finally, how do you follow activity? If you go on the AVO website, there is a, an activity page for every one of our volcanoes, and it has everything you ever want to know. Description, publications, images, maps, um, ash fall models. It's all, it's all there. So we encourage you to look at that anytime you want. Um, our instruments um, will be online very soon, and you could go to the instrument data and click on them and see what's happening. They're all public. And then we have um, a color code system and an alert level for reporting on volcanic activity. So don't need to pay too much attention now, um, but just as a intuitive thing, green means good and yellow, red means bad. Um, and so we kind of, green just is background. And once the volcano is completely turned online, we like to watch it for a while to see what background is. Then we'll go green. Right now it's gonna be unassigned. It'll be green, and if things start to escalate, we would go yellow, orange, and then red. Uh, and then there's, you know, these advisory levels that, that match that. Um, and then AVO issues a whole lot of different types of products. Um, you can sign up for these products. It's the only way to get them. Even our uh, partners have to sign up. And so if you go to this volcano, usgs.gov, VNS, volcano notification system, you can pick just a volcano. You can pick a whole region. You can pick the type of products that you want to get. So you can you can um, cater that to your needs. And then we're always asking for help. As I said, the community is, is our, our best witness to activity. Um, and so 
we encourage anyone, if you hear things through other people, just let us know. We do this all the time. And so we want to hear from you. We will answer the phone. We have people who work 24 seven and we're thrilled to get reports and we often will do our best to follow up on them. So um, please uh, reach out and thank you. I will now take any other questions that you might have. No questions? Wow. Okay. Um, but yeah, we, we don't want to desensitize people. So um, even if something's not happening right now, we're going to keep reaching out to Southeast Alaska communities. And if you ever have an interest or a need for your community to have some, some outreach, just let us know and we'll try to make it here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Greatly appreciate that presentation. Our, our next presenters is from the Alley Ute community of St. Paul. They are going to be talking about the Indigenous Sentinels Network. This is a virtual presentation. Uh, they were hoping that they could be here and unfortunately weren't able to make it. Um, Hannah Marie Garcia and Lauren Devine have been working on this project called the, again, the Indigenous Sentinels Project. And it's something that we are following closely in Southeast as we're developing out our Guardians program. And we'll have a bit more of a discussion on that come Friday uh, when Ralph Wolf is uh, here at the forum. Uh, he'll be leading that discussion on what a Guardians program looks like, how we're hoping to get tribes more involved with that and build it out together. Um, but this is a really good opportunity to get an understanding of more Guardians work that's happening in Alaska. And uh, the Aleut community of St. Paul has been um, pretty integral in, in pushing this program forward. So I'll dive in uh, again. I uh, really appreciate you all um, dealing in, with the patience of the technical difficulties. My name's Hannah Marie Garcia. I work for the Aleut community of St. Paul Island's tribal government. I really wish I could be there in person today, um, but unfortunately I'm calling in from Denina lands here in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, and I've been thrilled to be listening in so far and hearing a lot about the various different monitoring programs that are happening across the state with National Weather Service or um, the other presenters today and really emphasizing how to share local observations with managers. And I think that's something that ISN has really worked on over the past 20 plus years is identifying those pipelines where communities can um, build out their own community identified research priorities that can still collect data that can be used internally as well as sharing out to um, other state and federal agency managers. Um, so with that, I'll just dive right in and um, take a step back and, and give you a little history of um, where this program began. Um, it began over 20 years ago on St. Paul Island. Um, and for those unfamiliar with St. Paul Island, it's a 40 square mile island located in the middle of the Bering Sea. It's one of the Pripyat Islands that includes St. Paul and St. George. Um, we're sometimes described as the Galapagos of the North, just considering the fact that we have one of the most important seabird nesting sites in the Bering Sea. We host numerous vital cultural species and um, habitat for stellar sea lions, northern fur seals. So needless to say, um, our community, like many communities across the state, have deep ties with our environment and have been steward for those resources um, that they had depend on. And so ISN on our island really began with that interest in collecting data and understanding the health of our northern fur seals on island. Um, and really evolving with the technology and the community needs to address um, other species um, that we rely on on harvesting in um, our region. And so we use the, the tools and software to essentially collect data on um, adult male arrivals. Uh, we do adult female and pup departure counts on island. And all of this has now been in funded and through efforts with our tribal government um, through a, a formal co-management agreement with NIMS. So we are um, able to manage our species in partnership and through co-management um, and actually help provide information and collect data that can help our resource managers in the state and our local community members identify um, knowledge and, and information to help make more informed management decisions regarding our northern fur seal populations. Um, and when we think about 
ISN and Guardian programs, obviously the heart of those programs is the data collection efforts, but um, there's much more that goes into um, developing these monitoring programs. There's obviously the community owned online database. So ensuring that data collected is um, staying in the community is in a usable format for the community. Um, but then also having communication tools in place and a network in place to share information, share knowledge across regions about um, the observations that are being collected. We also provide training material support, grant writing for support and partnership development through the network. Um, and so while our um, monitoring programs are centered on collecting data, filling data gaps, it also um, encompasses this capacity building suite of supports through the network too. And so um, just to summarize again how, how it's gotten started over the past 20 years, we began with our, our Island Sentinel program on St. Paul um, and continued to expand when the technology was recognized um, as being flexible enough to address other community needs on invasive species monitoring. So we have a rat prevention program on island um, and then it expanded to migratory birds, coastal erosion monitoring, and then um, our Skipper Science Partnership Program as well. So ISN really has been increasingly recognized for the flexibility and adaptability. Um, so it's currently expanded its focus beyond just the Bering Sea. And we've been working with communities across the state of Alaska in developing um, these uh, robust, coordinated, community-driven and indigenous-led monitoring efforts across the state. Um, but really, it's more than just about where ISN is happening or where you can start community-based monitoring. It's also um, thinking about how and thinking deeply about how you have communities working through the process from the very beginning of identifying um, community data collection priorities and how do you learn from neighboring areas across the state. So these next few images come from a result of a mapping or constellation exercise that we did with our Indigenous Sentinels Advisory Assembly. Our Advisory Assembly in ISN is made up of um, Indigenous leaders and elders in the Northern Bering Sea, and we're hoping to grow that into other areas, but really to help guide um, the development of ISN, the improvements in the technology. Um, and so again, it's it, in this exercise and dialogue with our advisory assembly, we were emphasizing that it's not just about starting a monetary program in one place, but it's also about ensuring that there's connecting um, opportunities and communication across various entities. And so recognizing that community-based monitoring and research in and of itself is kin making. Through research, we're developing strong and lasting meaningful relationships with our community members collecting the data, with the managers that need that data to make more informed decisions. And so what we're really talking about is ensuring that we're giving remote communities a tool for collecting long-term ecological monitoring, collecting real-time environmental data. So ensuring that the data that we're collecting can help inform um, local and regional scale decisions related to harvest next season or when to, to set quotas for harvesting um, valuable resources in a community and then communicating that information and data broadly. So identifying those pipelines, such as the one, uh, the presentation we heard earlier from National Weather Service, the need to help get data to improve weather forecasts. So helping to ensure that data that's collected from the community can be communicated to um, other entities broadly. And really a key foundation is ISN is, is recognizing the fact that um, traditional ecological knowledge and Western science, of course, are not either or, they're just different ways of knowing. And that that's so vital to ensure that the tools that we're developing help support uh, the collection of, of different types of data um, for the community and then really recognizing that successful conservation efforts or successful research projects have to have local communities at the heart of the research questions, at the heart of the design, and then really ensure that as we're filling these data gaps, as we're collecting information on our chasing environment, that it's community-driven research priorities. Um, and really, when we think about building robust community-based monitoring programs or something similar to kind of a crowdsourcing data collection program, 
There's sometimes key issues um, related to data quality. So ISN over the past 20 years has really worked to improve data reliability with our software. And so we have um, opportunities for community admins or um, indigenous sentinels coordinators to ensure that data quality is being um, monitored as information comes in. And then we also address issues with data ownership. And so all of ISN's data collection tools and suite of tools ensure that the information that's collected is community owned, it stays within the community and then is shared broadly after. So it's ensuring that any of these efforts related to coastal erosion monitoring or migratory bird monitoring, um, the data is properly credited and um, stays in the community and there's a data ownership capability piece within our work. Um, so uh, like I said, uh, ISN has, um, a suite of tools um, that started again with our Northern Fur Seal Harvest, but has expanded to different programs across the state based on other communities' needs. Um, in this presentation, I'm gonna highlight a little bit from our Fish Map App program and um, our Harvest program. Uh, but also just to communicate as well that ISN, even though you know we, we talk about the advancing with technology and the tools to really help empower community members to do this robust data collection. Um, I never thought I'd be an app in tech design, but um, it's really just helping to develop a tool to um, help facilitate this knowledge sharing and also increase a, a central place for community members to collect data and, and see that data in a holistic space. So a lot of our community members um, can still operate with um, paper surveys that they're using or, or community members can call in information and storytelling, and then you can also transfer all of that information into a database. It doesn't have to necessarily run through apps, but it's just that principle of having a community-owned database to collect um, environmental monitoring information. And so I've been kind of talking a little high level and conceptual of where ISN began, the different components related to the tools that are involved, so I'm going to walk you through an example of if you were a hunter on St. Paul and you were collecting information um, after you harvested a, a northern fur seal. And keep in mind that as I walk through this example, a lot of what you're seeing can be really customizable to your community needs. Um, and so if you were a hunter out in the field and you're collecting information for a monitoring program on um, a vital cultural species, such as a northern fur seal, You'd essentially um, have this tool where you would log in with a secure username and password, um, and then you'd fill out um, these various pages that can be as short or as long as the, your identified source of information wants. For our, our harvest information, we do collect a lot of, of different um, sources of information that you'll see here. The first would be walking through collecting context information. So every user in ISN is assigned a community. Um, so in this example, I'm, I'm doing a harvest on St. Paul Island. I'm the one collecting data. You get um, start and end date time information. And also if you're out with a bunch of hunters, you can um, credit how many people are involved in this harvest um, as well. You collect environmental conditions. So anything from wind speed, sea state, um, collecting kind of that microclimate data that can be really important um, for some of our, our harvest scheduling as our seasons are shifting. We can look at this data from a past harvest and see um, if weather impacts were, were impacting the timing or departure of pups and when we can harvest on island. And of course we have location information as well. So you can pull a GPS point directly from your phone and the most important thing I forgot to mention is all of ISN's programs do not require Wi-Fi or cell signal to collect this information. A lot of our communities are in remote locations with no um, cellular data connections or Wi-Fi. And so all of this information can be saved on the device in the app um, to then be uploaded when, when a community member has connectivity issues or when it has a steady Wi-Fi signal, you can then upload the data. So that's a really key feature that we needed to have in the in the software for our community members harvesting information on St. Paul. Um, and then of course you can move into more granular information such as species. Um, all of the species lists can be customizable per region. Um, and then you can collect additional information such as um, age class, the sex of the species, the conditions and behaviors. So you can customize these lists too if you want people really looking for like if they're oiled or if it was molting, if it was branded or tagged. 
um, and then additional details too, such as where the species was located when you harvested it. And then also like it was the first one you had seen that month. So you can collect trend information data as well. Um, and so that's one of the more traditional data collection programs that we started with in St. Paul. Um, I'm now gonna shift gears and, and highlight the Fish Map app program. That is another example of how ISN software has been used to help crowdsource information. Um, and this was a project funded by US Fish and Wildlife Service and developed um, and, and the protocols and the tool were co-created in partnership with Fish and Game, ISN and the Northern Latitudes partnerships as well. Um, and Fish Map app, um, is kind of one of our more public community programs. So um, a lot of ISN's programs can be very tailored to be as private or as public as you want. If you just want the data to be used by community members or internally, you can have that. Fish Map app is open for anyone in any community to join. Um, and then the data is shared directly with Fish and Game. Again, ISN's efforts to identify proper pipelines for data to be shared with managers um, and to really help crowdsource efforts to to fill data gaps. So um, that was a lot of me talking at you. <laughs> and I'm going to hopefully um, I'm going to stop share real quick and then reshare to ensure my audio comes through. And I'm going to share a quick video that will help explain the fish map app and also highlight um, other community members beyond just my voice in this room that are integral for for these projects. So hopefully the sound comes through. If not, someone please interrupt and I'll stop sharing and we'll just move on. Salmon, Dolly Varden, hooligan, whitefish. From the sea to freshwater spawning habitat, anadromous fish mean a lot to Alaskans. Protecting fish habitat means protecting the well being of our communities, way of life, and ecosystems. Culturally, it's a part of the staple diet for many of the indigenous people here in Alaska. Yeah, salmon, you know, it, it's the number one species that we rely on in, in this area. It's really common for people, native and non-native, to be out fishing in the summertime to get their, their share of their fish for the winter. And then economically, Alaska is huge in the fishing industry, so it's one of those really important uh, resources that we have here in Alaska. The Alaska Department of Fish and Game is tasked with documenting water bodies that are important habitat for the spawning, rearing, or migration of anadromous fish in the Anadromous Waters Catalog and Atlas, or AWC. Streams and lakes specified in the AWC are afforded protections under the Anadromous Fish Act. Despite ongoing efforts to add water bodies to the AWC, significant gaps in its coverage remain, particularly in remote and difficult to access regions of Alaska. Now, you can join the effort to fill in those habitat gaps. Through a new, easy-to-use smartphone app, you can submit observations while you're out on the land. So having this app be a way to get boots on the ground and have people be the power and the data um, is pretty unique in order to help fill that data gap and, and get more information about the anadromous waters and streams and fish species that are there. And so with climate change and the shifts that are occurring and the environment changing in ways that we can't keep up with. This is another way to showcase and track that. It has all the regions in here, Arctic, Interior, South Central, Southeast, Southwest, and West. By helping to map where these fish exist, all you need to do is find some fish, fill out a few simple data fields, collect photos, Go and right. hit submit. And hit save. I think that this is one of those tools that I hope we can use to crowdsource this data. Because there are people who go places that I have never been, even on this island. I've been to a lot of places on this island. You know, we got a lot of trappers around here. You know, people that just go out and sightsee and, and try to go to remote areas where people haven't been. And I think they would love to use the app. Here's the kicker. Submit an observation that the Alaska Department of Fish and Game approves as new data, and we'll send you money to reward your efforts. 
we're hoping to solve the challenge of uncatalogued fish habitat by learning from the people that know the land best, you. So whether we're talking about the economic benefit of protecting the habitat of anadromous fish or the cultural benefit or the everyday recreational joy that we get by utilizing these streams and rivers, um, it's important to all Alaskans. This app could change a lot of what we do and how we see the interaction between the forests and the streams and the fish in the forest. I mean, there are so many species that, that all play a part in order to have a proper functioning ecosystem. We've been able to harness what we harvest from the land. You know, we don't cultivate the land, you know, the land cultivates us. This app was made possible through a collaboration between the Indigenous Sentinels Network, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and the Northern Latitudes Partnerships. Okay, um, so I, I love the Fish Map App program because it kind of highlights the power of, again, dry, bringing together a community identified need to protect vital um, fish habitat for spawning species in a region and also help collaborate with department fish and games and state managers to really ensure that data priorities identified by communities are also helping to impact um, state and regional level decision making when it comes to habitat and centering communities as vital to that process um, based on knowledge and, and place-based uh, experience of these areas. And so um, if you want to learn more about that program and how it's a, an example of how you can use ISN software to develop a community-driven monitoring program, um, check out our Fish Map app website and contact ESA for, for more questions. Um, and then just, just to wrap up um, and emphasize that ISN is, is really excited to continue to build out these partnerships across region, including in um, Southeast with the groups here in the room with you. Um, and we have some really exciting um, expansions and rebuild projects coming in 2024. Um, in response to this growing need for a practical and easy to implement community-based monitoring programs, um, or a tool that can help the sport of developing carving programs or community-driven pro monitoring programs in Alaska and Canada. In 2019 and 2020, um, our tribal government invested heavily in uh, designing the next generation of ISN. And so we're scaling up a lot of our technology, um, potentially implementing a software as a service program and platform for community members to help better serve the geographic expanse of our network and communities and really help um, improve identified needs uh, for more ability for two-way conversation to be happening with communities. So that push notification and alert system for sentinels in remote locations to potentially look at wind speed or validate wave height, um, similar to what the National Weather Service brought up this morning um, how can we really start to empower community members to potentially participate in improving weather prediction models by having a tool that communicate and push notifications directly to you when that information is requested? Um, we're also enhancing our mapping capabilities um, within the program and then also further emphasizing the need to um, respect and honor the time it takes for communities to collect this data. And so improving our ability to do a pay per observation, internet-based payment system for some programs to implement, um, and also having conversations with management agencies and funders about if they are asking community members to do this community-driven monitoring, that there's compensation um, for that time and effort to collect information in these regions. Um, and we're also continuing to build out data privacy and um, data sovereignty improvements. So being able to track when and where data is shared and, and ensuring that when data is shared, it's properly credited to the community that collected that information is something that we're building into the software to ensure that there's an ability for tribes and communities to understand where their knowledge is being shared. Um, and so with that new build in 2024, we're, we're kind of this is just some mock-ups or examples of what the next generation of ISN is going to look like. Um, just wanted to kind of leave you all with, with ideas here where I think before we had 
described, there's like a, a lot of various programs that are happening, but they're all going to get consolidated into um, one simple app that can be broken out into different communities or regions. All of these can be public or not public. Uh, users are going to have more um, of a customized profile that gives them a running total of how much, many observations they're contributing, the impact that they're having to these programs, um, and as well as the survey form builder that we're building into the software, communities can create surveys based on needs, respond to real-time information, like we really need to start monitoring our CDOC and goals so they can quickly and easily create a survey, have protocols and training materials uploaded directly into the device to help community members and citizens understand how to collect information, where that information goes, um, and the importance of those programs. So helping with education and training along with um, a physical tool that can collect that information. Um, and so with that, um, I'll wrap and I'm really interested in just hearing if there's any questions or, or dialogue and just reiterate that again, um, you know, we started this on island over 20 years ago. And at the heart of our program, it's really to understand that there's an importance to collect indigenous local and traditional knowledge as well as scientific information in a way that's standardized, repeatable, um, and can empower holistic natural resource management decisions, both at the local level and at higher federal and state management levels to really help ensure that we're all working together in a way that helps us um, build data gaps and better manage our resources going into the future based on all the shifts and changes that we're seeing. Um, and of course, there's a lot of folks to acknowledge for over 20 years of, of work on this. And so um, with that, I'll say, um, um, and I'll close for questions.